Tonight is the Roundtable, family. It's the Roundtable, episode 38. That's right. We're up to episode 38 now. We had a lot of roundtables that went down on Debates to Talkie Radio. And if you missed any previous ones, you can always go back to the archives. Always go back to the archives and check out the past shows. Let's go to the iTunes podcast. Type in the search box, Debate Talk View. Subscribe. Never miss another episode. It's absolutely free. Go to the Blog Talk Radio website, which is www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Debate Talk View. Or go to the YouTube page, which is youtube.com forward slash Debate Talk View. The topic of discussion in this roundtable is... The man of sin, who is it? Once again, today's discussion, the title of this discussion is The Man of Sin, Who Is It? Uh, The way this uh, roundtable came about, uh, basically I saw a video that was up on Facebook by one of the, you know, special guests that's here with us tonight, and I'm going to introduce him, of course, to the world in a few minutes. So the video, found it very interesting, and I was like, you know what, we need to do a show about that. So I invited a few brothers. I'm still waiting for a few more people to call in, actually. And uh, once they all get here, of course, you know, uh, that'll be cool. I'm going to reach out to some of them on the back chats and see if I get everybody here. It's supposed to be at least seven people here or six here tonight on Debate Talk Radio. But uh, in the meanwhile, I'm going to introduce the people that's already here right now. So I'm going to introduce the first person that's actually responsible for this whole roundtable coming together. This is my brother, B.A. Welcome to the show. Yo, what's the word? Uh, all praises due to the Most High God in the name of his holy anointed, the Christ. And uh, I would like to thank Sal for allowing us to come on this platform today and to actually discuss this information because I really believe that it needs to be discussed instead of just dictated to us. And uh, much love to all those on the panel. Um, it's just a privilege to um, be on here with uh, my big brother, the Doc, and my big sister, Shanti. And most definitely, uh, I'm, I've been waiting on this one. And um, we'll sit back and just enjoy the dialogue. And I yield. Right, listen up, B.A. You know, listen, you don't come on the show a lot, man. You got to let people know who you are, little B. Bio. You know, <laughs> let the people know what you do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yes, uh, for those who are not familiar with me, um, I'm out here on the West Coast, out, um, out in California, raised up in Sacramento. Uh, pretty much I'm a member of the Nazarene Messianic Party uh, out here, and I'm out here in California. I'm, I'm not a teacher. I'm a student of the word. Uh, do I identify with being an Israelite? Yes, I do. Um, and and like what I like to do, I like to study and share information. That's it. Um, I'm active, too, where in my community where I live at. So that's it, man. I, I don't have a big bio. I just put out information, and I every now and then I'll join in a discussion or uh, minor debate once in a while and just present information. And that's pretty much it, Sal. All right. Once again, that's Brother B.A., Brother B.A. from the West Coast, representing on Debate Talk Radio. We appreciate you. And by the way, if y'all missed the show, uh, we had a show about uh, a couple nights ago. We had a powerful discussion, our Israelites, Black Supremacists. Our Israelites, Black Supremacist, Brother Bia was on a panel. I'm, I'm still getting a whole bunch of great feedback from that particular show. So if you missed it, go to the archives, go back and check that out. And I know you're definitely going to appreciate that. Leave your comments in the, you know, the comment board on YouTube. But let's go to the next special guest. My next special guest, she's actually going to be joining us as a regular on the new segment that we have called Under the Palm. It's going to be an all-female Hebrew show for the ladies. You know what I'm saying? That's right. We're representing for the ladies this season on Debate Talk Radio. She's here tonight representing on this round table. This is Ashanti. Welcome to the show. Shalom, Sal. Shalom, everyone tuning in. Um, praise the Most High Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, for this opportunity to be on discussing this 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 matter with my with my humble brother Ba, my lovely brother Zadok. Uh, this is just going to be awesome and powerful. We hope people uh, are edified. We hope people are influenced and encouraged to go back and study, uh, spend some time with the Father, get that personal relationship, get 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 pit, poked and prodded to actually search spiritually deep within um, to, to get some understanding so that we may properly uh, walk uh, this, this Israelite faith. Um, that's what I have to say for now, Sal. Uh, a lot of people know me, not a lot, but just a few. But, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm out on the West Coast in California, um, in Sacramento as well. So I'm, I'm looking forward to um, discussing this, this matter. All 
I we definitely appreciate you, uh, appreciate you, Ashanti, coming on right here on the Bay Talk. Like I said, we have a new segment under the palm, y'all. Look out for that under the palm. We promoting a new segment on the Bay Talk Radio. I my next special guest. You know, he's no stranger to the show. He's been here since season two of the Bay Talk for you in the Lions Den, outside of the Lions Den, teaching lessons. You know, just you know, made, made intros for the show, <laughs> all type of stuff. My brother is here tonight. This is my brother Zadot. Welcome to the show, man. Appreciate you, man. Praise. Yeah. What's poppin'? What's going on, man? What's going on? I was, I was waiting for you to break that record. Like, you're going to go a minute with that, friend. <laughs> Yeah, he's he about to break his record tonight. But what's going on, man? Uh, let's do the <laughs> what's happening with you, brother? Oh, man. Praise the Most High God, man. All praise is due to the Most High God, man, creator of the universe, Yahuwah, Yahweh, Yahweh, however cats want to argue about him. Noah hires, though. Noah hires. If, 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 if that rock hits you, I wasn't trying to miss you. Um, but yeah, man. You already know what it is, Sal. We doing what we do, man. It's your brother Zadok Ben Israel, aka the God Hop MC. Hashtag just a vessel, nobody special. Supreme Sword Cotter's on display tonight. Um, I got my brother BA in here and my little bro in the face, man. But he, he carry a heavy cotter blade. And Sister Ashanti, even though you're going to put her on the woman's segment, you know, so the sisters can get some shine, she giving dudes problems. Real talk. She giving dudes problems. So, um, blessing to all my brethren out on the West Coast, and um, blessing to all the uh, regular debate talk for you, family, and blessings to you too, Sal, man. You've been consistent over the years, man, and I just pray that uh, people don't take for granted what the Lord put on your heart to provide for the community, man. All right, man. It's Brother Zadok right here on the Bay Talk for you, man. Anything you want to put out there, man? Matter of fact, nah, we're going to say that for later. We're going to say that for later. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I do projects and stuff like that. We're going to say that for another time. You know, Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom, y'all. Shabbat Shalom. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. But let's go, <laughs> let's go to my other brother, uh, Amayan. He's from the West Coast, too. We got a lot of West Coast connections going on tonight on the Big Talk Radio. Amayan, welcome to the show, man. Hey, Shalom, Sal. Shalom to all the uh, brothers, the sister online as well. I like to give all praises to the Most High God, Yahweh, his name in the Hebrew, which means I am, he is, and calls us to be his first begotten son, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, Christ Jesus in the English, uh, and to all of the righteous forces that's protecting us as we continue to do the Most High's work. And as our brother Jude puts it in his book, for us to contend for the faith, once delivered to the saints, I'd like to say uh, Shabbat Shalom to all the brothers and sisters that the sun is down in your area, and Shalom to all the listeners. All right, so like I said, we're supposed to have maybe two more people and reach out to them in the back chat to try to get everybody else here. But in the meanwhile, let's get this thing started, family. Let's get it started. Again, today's show is entitled The Man of Sin. Who is it? Like I said, being that brother BA, you know, made the video. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave the video actually in the description box for those who don't, who didn't watch the video. I'm going to leave it in the description box as well as all the information to all the special guests so you can reach out to them once the show is over. But brother BA, I'm going to let you start it off. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sal. Appreciate it. Now, the thing is, is that it's commonly taught in the uh, Israelite community. Uh, I don't want to say the whole Israelite community, but this is a teaching that needs to be really reexamined. And um, this doctrine is called the man of sin who sits in the temple. And it's commonly taught that the man of sin is going to um, I'll just go over it real quick. This individual, he's going to come into the temple. Of the, he's going to come and go to Jerusalem when the time comes to where a temple will be built. And from there, after the temple was built, three and a half years, he's going to start the, the so-called Great Tribulation. Some Christians say seven. And pretty much what happens is after this, it's supposed to be a time of trouble, all this turmoil. And a lot of people identify this individual as the Antichrist. And the thing is, is that after the three and a half years, it is taught that that's when the Messiah, Christ, as we believe we know to be Christ, to come back and to establish the kingdom on earth um, or, or the kingdom will fill as a mountain rabbit. But what I want to do 
I want to really examine how this is commonly taught. And a lot of brothers who teach out of this, they use the King James. So what we're going to do for the King James only individual, this is not an attack on anyone's teacher, no one's elder. This is just throwing some questions out there that need to be answered. So what I'm going to do, we're going to turn to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I just want to throw some things out there. And I'm, I'm going to be reading from the 1611 King James, and I also have a Greek-English interlinear New Testament that lines up with the Greeks because we understand that the, we, we know we understand that the King James New Testament is written in Greek. So we have to deal with context. Context is key. I have a hard time believe, I have a hard time understanding why all of a sudden we read the book and for some reason context all of a sudden we don't got to worry about context. That just really blows that that's really just it really it's mind boggling. But let me get to it. I'll start at verse one, second Thessalonians chapter two, pick up verse one. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Now, a lot of people tend to say that when Paul was speaking this, I'm not saying all the people that teach this, but I have heard various people say that when Paul had mentioned that uh, don't be troubled, uh, that the day of the Lord or the day of Christ is at hand, some people say that oh, he, Paul was talking about years after him. I don't, I'm fully convinced that that's not, that's not what he's talking about. The apostles taught, and like I said, we're reading the apostles. The, the apostles taught that the day of Christ or his second coming was going to come as the day they were teaching. Paul is writing this letter, and he is speaking. He is saying that the, the second coming of the Messiah could happen as I write this letter to you. There are some people who disagree. Um, that's fine, but we're going to keep going. Verse 3, and this is where they jump off and start with this doctrine. Let no man deceive you, Right? By any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So what I want to do, man, I like to deal, since we're dealing with the King James, I like dealing with context. That's one thing about me. When it comes to the King James, uh, there are tools that have been provided, thank the Most High for that, that help us get a better understanding because we're still dealing with the translation. I'm not saying we've got to study the Greek language and learn it. What I'm saying is we have to understand this is removed from the original um, language that is, um, was originally written in, and we know that the King James has a history of grammatical errors. I'm not speaking against the King James. That's the text I use. But to get a better clarification, there are tools out here. We have the Strong's Concordance. We have Thayer's. And we have various other Bible lexicons. And we also have Greek language-speaking lexicons that will help as well. So what I want to do, for those who are following along, let's turn, let's look at the first, um, let's go back to verse 3 and the first, few, the first sentence, let no man. We're going to look at this word man, and we're going to see, I, I, I got to go this route because, so, I can, so we can build and see what the apostle was talking about. It, 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 it really, um, it makes a lot of sense. So the word, let me see, go to 400. And 44 in the Strong's. 444. And give me a quick second. I'm almost, yes. And the word is anthropos. And this is what it means. The, um, it could be a human being, or also it says the definition, anthropos is used generally of a human being, male or female, without reference to sex or nationality. Okay, so what Paul is saying here is that, hey, let no one deceive you. Don't let your mom, your dad, your cousin, your sister, your niece, your nephew, nobody deceive you by any means for that day should not come except there be there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So now what we got to do is look, all right, there's a falling away. Uh, a lot of people teach there's an apostasy. Uh, let's talk about the apostasy. A lot, of, a lot of teachings were going out around this time historically about what was, uh, what was going on when it came to Christ, when it came to a second coming. Um, there was a lot of debates and arguments that Paul, Paul was dealing with a lot of individuals in this time. He was dealing with the Epitarians, the, the Sophists, various characters. So there was a lot of doctrine going on back then, just like now, a whole bunch of doctrine. So he's saying the falling away first, so that falling away got to happen first, 
and that man of sin be that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition or the son of destruction. So we got right here the apostle is saying, he's saying, let no one deceive you. But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the uh, to the interlinear Greek real quick. Second Thessalonians chapter two, and I want to read it because this is a inter, this is a what is it? It is a English interlinear New Testament, and it fits. It, it makes it makes per, I mean it lines up with what Paul is trying to say, or what Paul is saying rather. And I read it as to the coming of our Lord Jesus, and our being gathered together to Him. We beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarm, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Wow. He said the day of the Lord is already here. This is so, man, I mean, okay. Let's keep going. Verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way. Okay, now, in the King James, it said, let no man deceive you. But in the Greek text, it says, let no one deceive you. So right here, this just lines up with the concordance. And if you don't believe me, you can check in the fairs, and you can also check in the intermediate Greek lexicon written by Liddell and Scott. I've done the research. If you don't believe me, you can look it up for yourself. So what we're going to do, but verse 3, and go back to it, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. This falling away, this uh, apostasy, this different type of, he said rebellion. So there's got to be a falling away. There's going to be something going on prior to the Most High, which is prior to Christ making his second coming. And, and it also says, and that lawless one is revealed. This is what it says in the uh, Greek English interlinear New Testament. Now let's go to, now let's just read it again in, in the King James. And I apologize, I'm kind of nervous my first time doing this on the debate talk with you. Uh, Let's read verse 3 again. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day should not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. So what I want to do, I want to look up this word man, the second occurrence of man. It's very interesting uh, how um, what this word is in the Greek. And we're going to turn in the Strong's Concordance. And the number is 5100, that's 5100, 5100, and, and we have it, it is, give me a quick second, lost my place, okay, 5100, the word is kiss, and it says, an eclectic and definite pronoun, now before I go, hold on, let me read one more, some or any person or object. Let me just read some of the other other words they're using. Certain, some, any man, anyone, man, anything. Now, I just want to ask anybody on the panel. Other than what I read, when you, when you hear eclectic and definite pronoun, what's your understanding on that? And I'll ask everybody. Anybody? All right, hold on. Let me open up the mic. I was hearing like a beeping sound. You heard that beeping sound earlier? Yeah, like I heard it earlier, yeah. You had, to, you had to mute the mics, but let me open up everybody's mics again. Hold on, hold on. All right, Ashanti, you can start first. Go ahead. Um, well, just for me, beginning to learn biblical Greek, um, an, an enclitic, um pronoun, um, it usually has a word uh, preceding it, such as the word of or and or the and it usually is um, an eclectic pronoun. A pronoun could be anyone. You know, it, it's not a specified. It's not a specified male or female, man or woman. It could be anyone. And I yield. Anybody else? Uh, let's go with Amayan. Good. Okay. Well. I've not looked up that word, you know what I'm saying, so I really don't know, you know what I'm saying, too much about it, so I don't know. I'd just like to address certain things that he mentioned before, if I can, if I can, you know, if I can't, I won't, but um, as far as this question, I don't have an answer right now because I've not looked the word up. All right, let's go to Zadok first, and uh, let's see if Brother B.A. is ready for the question from Uh Zadok, go ahead. Um, peace, peace. Yeah, 
um, respectfully, um, I think the last brother going to have a problem with whatever he's going to want to say moving forward because if he don't understand the exact word that he may teach means antichrist, he has a problem because that – the, the the phrase the man of sin is basically going to be the crux of the discussion. You have to be able to tell the audience what this phrase means, just as if you would teach them what the word Israel means, or if you would teach them um, the Hebrew word Adam when it applies to man as like an individual or mankind. So I I just want to put that on the table because I really didn't expect that. Um, so I'm hoping that others who may have a similar uh, stance as him coming to this discussion because it has to be understood. A pronoun is different from a noun. The word individual itself is a pronoun because it doesn't point to a specific person. We are all individuals. And so the pronoun could apply to anyone. So there would have to be more scriptural text to get the specificity of a particular person if there is one at all. That's all. all right, hold that thought. Uh, Carmelo and Robert Reed, if you're out there, we have a lot of listeners right now. You have to press number one in the phone line so I can bring y'all in. You have to press number one in the phone lines so I can bring y'all in. And then, uh, Brother B.A., do you, is there anything else you want to address before we let Amayana? Because he has some questions for you, obviously. Do you want me to say them, ask what? them now, or you want to just continue and bring out some more first? Let, let me bring out a little bit more first, then we'll let the brother speak his piece. All right, that's continue. All right. All right. Now, I'm going to go to the Thayer's Greek lexicon. Though doesn't it, isn't it written, I think, I think it's in the prophets where it says, in the law and the prophets, it says two or more witnesses. Well, guess what? I got another witness. So my homeboy Strong's, we ain't got to use them no more. We're going to go to the homeboy Thayer's. Check this out. The word is tis, indefinite, implicit pronoun, bearing the same relation. Let me see. Um, a certain, a certain one use of persons and things concerning which the writer either cannot or would not speak more particularly. That's another witness. But I gotta go one more because if because I'm this is for the people. This is not about making anyone that teaches this look bad or support it. I'm just putting this out there because this has to be clarified. If we're going to be reading the New Testament and we're going to believe it, we got, if we believe it to be the word of the Most High, we got to also understand that it was written in a language prior to it being in English. There was an individual on Facebook that had a problem with the Strongs a few days ago with one of my other older brothers. He said, we don't deal with no Gentile sources. And anyone that thinks like that, that just, that just, you're just admitting the stupidity that you have. Because if you're going to sit here and tell me that we're not going to deal with Gentile sources, then guess what? Your King James was translated by Gentile. Think about it. But I'm, I'm going to keep going. I got another witness. It's called an Intermediate Greek English Lexicon by Lindell and Scott. Now, this is not a Bible lexicon. This is just a lexicon based on the Greek language. So if I'm going to look up, the, look up the origins of a word in Greek, I'd rather deal with the person who knows the language other than those that don't speak the language. You don't go uh, to a word for every... Yeah, go ahead, sis. Yeah, may, may, may I ask them real quick about the Liddell and Scott? Um, just, just, yep. just to add yeah. to what you were saying, as it's a critical source uh, of, of a lexicon, it is a classical Greek lexicon, um, more so first century A.D., the, the actual definitions for the words that, that uh, the New Testament was written in, the Koine or classical Greek, it's, it's more attested by scholars, and it has the original definitions of the words um, for Greek between 1000 B.C. and 600 A.D. So I just wanted to add that real quick. And this is a credible source. So I'm going to read the definition in a Greek language lexicon, like I said earlier. If I'm going to get some understanding of the language I don't know, I'm going to go to the people who speak the language. I'm not going to go to anyone that speaks English that's not dealing with context. The word is tis. Again, we have it. Indefinite pronoun. Any, anyone or anything eclectic through all cases. All right, let's keep going. And um, 
And so now we understand when Paul said that man is sin be revealed, this is open to anybody. But it's commonly taught that it's some Christians say Muslim, a lot of a lot of Hebrews who teach this, because I don't want to paint my brothers with one brush. Um, that's not my style, like others we know of. But still, the thing is, is that I just want to make sure that we understand that the man of sin is open to anyone, because the word translated to the, to the, the, the word that man was translated from is tis. That means it's an indefinite pronoun. So if Paul was talking about a specific person, he would not use the word tis while he was writing this in the Greek language, and we understand Paul to write, he spoke Greek. So if he spoke it, I'm pretty sure the man had enough sense to write it and knew what he was talking about when he wrote the letter. That's if we're going to sit here and believe this word to be the true word of God. If it's the true word of God, the most High is going to make sure that we have a proper understanding of what his prophets and apostles in Christ had revealed to us. All right. And it says that man is saying be revealed the son of perdition. The son of destruction. Let's keep going. Verse 4. Who opposed it and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he, he asked God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, what I want to do, I got to go back and use my sources again. Because in the 1611 King James, the word temple was capitalized. So we have to sit back and see. Now, did he specifically, was Paul talking about a literal building structure? Because it's, it's commonly taught that this man is saying, rather than be a Muslim or a pope, is going to sit in the temple. But we just proved to you, based on the grammar, based on the text context, that Paul was not talking about a literal person. Because it's commonly taught that it's the pope or the a Muslim. So this is an eclectic and definite pronoun consists of anyone, male or female. So people who respond to this, I don't want to hear no Hebrew Israelite chauvinist rhetoric. I want to deal with the context of what the apostle was writing in his letter. So you know what? What's all I would do, Sal? The brother who wanted to uh, speak, he can go ahead and say what he wants to say now before I go any further. All right, cool. Before we I want, do I want that, to hear him deal, with the, deal with that. Yeah. Before we do that, I just want to let people know Robert Reed is here. Robert Reed is in the building. Let me introduce him right quick. Uh, he just got here, so of course he's going to listen in to a little more. Robert Reed, say hello to the people. Hey, how's it going, Sal, man? Appreciate you having me on. Can you hear me okay? You're loud and clear. You're loud and clear. Mm-hmm. All right. Hey, peace to all the brothers on the line. I appreciate it. I'm just going to listen in a little bit. You know, I don't want to jump in in the middle and just start running my mouth without, you know, hearing what everyone has to say. But I appreciate all the listeners for, you know, uh, just tuning in, and I appreciate Sal having me on the platform. All right, Robert, we, we appreciate you. All right, I'm Ayan. Go ahead, man. All right, thank you, Zal. The first thing I want to address is the brother is the brother is, is saying that uh, the apostles is under some kind of impression that they were saying that how Christ can come in their time. Now, according to this Bible, there's certain things that have to happen before Christ come back, which the apostles know. I just want to read one of them in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 23, 24. Sorry, I want to read verse 14. It says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. At the time of Paul, the gospel was not preached unto all nations. They didn't reach everybody at that time. There is no way that they could be under some kind of understanding that he can come in their time when the gospel they was preaching didn't reach all nations. And Christ taught them this. Now let me show you where Christ taught his apostles and showed them the understanding of the Old Testament. They were not under no impression that he was coming back in their time. Okay, let me get the book of Luke. The 24th chapter. Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> I want to start at verse 44. It says, And he said unto them, These things, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Uh, then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. It's the Old Testament. They understood the Old Testament and the prophecies in the Old Testament that precede Christ's coming. They were not under no impression that Christ was going to come in their time. 
okay? So the gospel, again, was not preached unto all nations in, in, in the apostles' time. They passed it on to other men who transferred it, and, and, and they spread it even more places that they couldn't get to. Now I want to go to where the brother was reading at in Thessalonians here. Because when we had the conversation on the phone, I, I asked the brother, says, your conclusion has got to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, how, how is that the truth? And when I went over and I studied it, it seemed that he got these two words backwards. The first word is not anthropos. The first, the, the first word there, man, is tis. That first word isn't anthropos. It is tis. The second word, man, that's anthropos. That's a human being. I want to read it. That wouldn't make any sense the way Paul is saying it if the first word is anthropos. Because tis means anyone or whoever. That's what he's saying about being deceived. Don't let no one, anyone, nobody deceive you. That, that's who he's talking about. And then the second man is getting pacific. He's labeling him as the son of perdition. This is a pacific person. This cannot, not, this cannot be tis. God, that's anybody. How can just anybody be the son of perdition? That wouldn't make any sense. So I want to go back. Let me read it here in, in uh, Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Yeah. Getting right to the point. Verse 3. It says, let no man deceive you. That man again is tis. Talking about anyone. Don't let anyone or nobody whosoever. Don't let them deceive you. Nobody at all. Deceive you by any means, for that they shall not come except there come a falling away first. This falling away first is the Greek word apostasia. Apo is from or away from. Stasia is stand or to stand. It is a stand away from or, a st or, in, or in opposition to evil. There is a rebellious stand that have to, have to happen against evil before Christ come in. This is what this word apostasia, Greek, it is saying. He's giving you a prerequisite before Christ coming. There's got to be a standing up against evil first before this man even come. It goes on to say, uh, except there be a falling away first, it says, and that man, Anthropos, a human being of sin, uh, some, some manuscripts have the word anomia, which A is uh, without, nomia is Torah. The man without the Torah uh, be revealed, the son of perdition. So he, there is specific labels being, being placed on this person here. This can't be Tis because Tis is anyone. How do you put a specific label on, on, on anyone whosoever, anywhere, as the son of perdition? That, that wouldn't make any sense because anyone, anywhere, or everywhere is not the son of perdition. This is specifically for people who are going to hell. Everybody's not going to go to hell, so it can't be anyone. It can't be or everyone or whosoever. It must be speaking of someone specific, and it gets clearer again. The next verse says, who? Who again? This is letting you know it's talking about a specific person who opposes and exalts himself. Speaking of an individual, this cannot be anybody. It says, above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, these pronouns are letting you know that Paul is speaking of an individual, so that last man again cannot be tis. Uh, he of God, set up in the temple of God, show of himself to be God. Now, in the brother video, when he went to go define the word neos, the brother next to him read the definition of neos, and it says temple or shrine. But then he goes on to use the term in figures. And he's going with the figurative definition of this word and saying that that's what it means and it is not temple. The word can mean temple, but he has not given us any proof why he's going with the figurative definition over the regular definition of temple or shrine. It is clear. We have a man in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 11, that's coming. We have a man in uh, the, in the book of uh, Revelation, chapter thirteen, uh, chapter seventeen, chapter eighteen, spoken of of coming and doing these things. So there is someone coming specifically. So and Paul is here speaking of this man briefly. Okay, and I'm gonna end it there because I want to hear his his response to that. 
I would rather be able to pull okay. you in. I just gotta so let you know I gotta step away for a few minutes, but I'm gonna leave everybody mic open and I'll be right back. I just gotta take this phone important phone call. All right, so everybody mic is open though. Go ahead, go ahead, yeah, you could respond. Okay, okay. First let's deal with Matthew twenty four. All right, my bro, turn to Matthew twenty four. I'm gonna deal with it bit by bit. I'm gonna go in the order you did you went in. Let me know when you're there, bro. I'm there. All right. I need you to pick it up in verse. Let's see. Vic, read verse two. Read verse two and um, and read verse two and three. Verse two. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you. There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Continue. Okay. Yeah, keep going. Verse 3. Verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of them? Stop. That's one question. And the other question is, and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? So when did the Messiah answer their first question? When did he answer their first question? Yep. As you read on further down, he he gave them certain signs of things happening preceding his coming. No, that's that's not what I asked you. I'm 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 gonna ask you again. When did the Messiah answer their first question? Do you know what the first question was? Do you know what the first question is about? He's at, he's he he's asking them. Let me read it. No, he's I'm not going to speculate. He's not asking. He's, me, not them, the, the, he's not asking. The apostles are asking him. Okay, I understand. I said I'm a, I'll, I'm going to read it. It says, as he sat upon the mount of olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, "Tell us when shall these things be?" He was speaking of he was speaking of the temple being thrown down. That one stone should not be left upon another. Okay. So now he, when he, he asked, now when, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so he like I said, when you when you when you read down when you read down further, he he, he talks about um Jerusalem being destroyed. When you read in different okay. gospels in, in, in Luke. Okay, that that's not what I asked you. I'm I'm talking about Matthew twenty four. We're gonna deal with Luke. But I'm asking Matthew twenty four. When did he answer their first question that you just admitted to that they were talking about the destruction of Jerusalem? When did he answer the first question? Where he after answered, that? It is recorded in Luke book. No, it's no, it's not. It, it, it is. is it? it is recorded in Luke. It is recorded. I agree. That's my fault. I agree. But guess what? It also it's also recorded in Matthew twenty four, where you just I mean that same you read it earlier when you first came on. You want to know when he answered it? Want me to help you with that? Because it sounds I'm, like you I'm don't have a clue. No, it sounds like you got a clue. Brother, you, brother, my, I went here to show you that the gospel was going to preach unto all nations. That that's not did not I have happened you, in their time. Bro, that's I not what I asked I understand what you asked ask me. No, okay, you don't, you don't understand what I'm asking you. Because if you did, you would go right to where he answered the first question. So stop stalling and just say you don't know. How am I stalling? Okay. Let's go to verse 14. No, I'm sorry, verse okay, 15. Verse, four- verse 15. Verse 15. Verse yep, 15. Verse 15. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, real quick. Yeah. Real, real quick. Uh, for context, maybe start at verse 4. Okay, verse 4. Yeah, let me, let, me, let me do this. For my fault, that's my apologies. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name. Now, now hold on. He's talking to the apostles. All right, now let's go to verse 6. I mean, verse 5. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. He's, now, right here, he's talking about his second coming. He answered their second question. I'm sorry, he answered their second question first. I've heard people say that he ignored the first question. No. Verse 6, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that, not, see that ye be not troubled. So, in, nation, in verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and these are the beginning of sorrows. 
Then he goes on and talks about the false prophets and the many things are going to happen. We're going to betray each other, all that. And about, about man, the, the, the love, the wax, love shall wax cold. So he's talking about his second coming. But let's go back to verse 3. He said, and he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things, these things be. He, they were talking about the destruction of the temple because he was prior to that. You can read in Matthew 23, the Messiah was in the temple. And this is Matthew 24, it's the same thing. He was walking out of the temple. So the, the, the disciples and whoever were around him, they were wondering, when shall these things be? Because he was talking about the destruction of the temple. Let's go to when he answered their first question. Because now we just clarified and proved that he answered their second question first. Verse 15. And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standeth in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, if I'm reading this, I'm way out here in California. How am I going to flee and go to the mountains from way to California? Specifically, he said, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. This is for them who he's talking to. He's not talking to nobody 15 to 1,800 years later. He's talking to the apostles and those who are listening to him. Now, we can turn, now we can turn to Luke 21 because it's the same conversation. We, we, you, I mean, you, I mean, you want to do that, bro? Or what, what's your response to that? Well, first of all, brother, you, you didn't address where I went to. I went to the 14th verse, and I, I, I specifically read it says that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. That did not happen in the apostles' time. That has to happen first even before Christ come back. How can they be under some impression that Christ can come at any day when the gospel was not even nowhere near to being preached to all nations? Okay, bro. Let's see. Come on, hey. man. Come on, man. Hey. Come on, man. It makes hey, sense, bro. Hey, 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 my brother, tell me the Colossians chapter 1. Oh. Hey, can y'all hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Doc. Hey, this is Brother Zadok. I just wanted to kind of push back on um, on what that brother is saying there because it is actually it is actually written in the text. If we go to Colossians chapter 1, Paul himself in his letter to the Colossians, and uh, I think it's uh, what, uh, verse 23, he said, if you continue in the faith and don't be moved away from the gospel um, that you have heard, which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, where I of Paul am made a minister. Paul himself in his own letter said that the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven. So in his day, the claim was that they had did the mission of what Christ demanded them. And remember, Paul came later. So he, that's why he said he was the least of the apostles, because the other apostles at least had 20 years together before he was officially a part of them, because it was 14 years before he even got to go visit Peter, John, James, and Andrew, because Barnabas came and introduced him. So when you look at Paul's letters, and then he says, look, um, uh, 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 we shall... Um, when you, in Thessalonians, he say, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed at the last trump. Those who are dead shall, um, you know, those who are dead shall rise first. And then he said, and then those of us which are alive. So they had no true understanding of exactly when the Lord would come. But in the context of how they worked, they did believe that the gospel had been preached for all nations in their time. Paul himself said that. So I just want to kind of push back a little bit, and, uh, and you may have a different explanation for that, um, w w which I am definitely glad to hear. Okay. The floor is yours, Again, my brother. Uh, what? Huh? The floor is yours, my brother. Okay. Where in, where, first of all, where in Colossian is it? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go look it up in the Greek. Because okay. Okay. Clearly, First Colossians, I mean, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 1. Okay, all right, like I said, I, I, I'd have to go look it up in the Greek to make sure that it's, it, was, it was translated correctly. So I'm going to go back and look it up. Second, second of all, is that where I read in the book of Luke 24, 
that they would that Christ opened their mind to understand the Old Testament, the Scriptures. Okay, when you go into the Old Testament, into the Scriptures, and specifically in the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter, it talks about four beasts coming out to sea. These four beasts coming out to sea have not came on the scene yet. These are beasts is in our future. They have not even came out of the sea yet. They have not oh, even okay. showed their face. They have not even they have not even showed their face yet. And the apostles, as he said, he opened their mind to understand the scriptures, which were the Old Testament. So if they understand Daniel that these four beasts are supposed to come out of the earth first, and they have not even showed their face at all, not in in their time. Again, how can they be under some impression that he's going to come in their time when you have four different kingdoms that's got to come out of the earth that have not even came in their time at all? It's not even came in our time yet. Okay, okay. Let's stop first because you just pretty much butchered the prophets. Okay, so let me just make sure that I'm understanding what you just said. The four B. kingdoms that de- – yeah. B.A., yeah, if you would about? allow me, Ak. Because he, ahead, kind of was, he kind of was addressing, it, instead of going to just, instead of, you should have even brought that up, my uh, uh, brother, yeah. uh, Amazon, I believe that's your name. You should have, we would have, we would have calmly waited for you to go get the Greek one, Colossians 1 and 23. I don't know if you read Greek or whatever, but you could have read it just to see if Paul was saying what I just read. I mean, I got, well, it wouldn't be my Septuagint, but I got a Hebrew, Greek, interlinear here. I also have a, um... I also have my King James, of course, and I got the new Oxford annotated Bible with the Apocrypha. So I have, um, I have some internet, I have some, I have some sources here. We just want to for that. When you go to Daniel seven, and in the same book, it actually tells you which each one of those four beasts were. Besides the fourth one, it actually names them. I don't know. I, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure where you're going. In the context of just seeing if Colossians 1 and 23 says what I just read, because you're bringing up a whole other can of worms, and I, I, I wouldn't want us to get off track, because this is all about that man of sin, and your whole thing is the man of sin can't, have, can't even be considered until the gospel has been preached to all nations, and I'm assuming you still believe that, none of, that there are still nations that haven't heard the gospel while we're speaking on the phone. Fine. Colossians 1 and 23 in the Greek is either going to say what I read or you're going to give us another translation. But to bring up Daniel 7 in the four beasts, which you say haven't even happened yet, which I totally disagree with, I think you're going to take us on another trajectory. Hey, brother, I just brought that up. I brought that up because of the scripture that I pulled in the book of Luke. That's why I brought that up. I brought that up as a link to show you that they understood things in the Old Testament. All right, just let you know I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm gonna... okay, what I was saying is that the reason why I brought up Daniel is because I read the scripture in Luke that they had the understanding of the Old Testament. And I, I mentioned that in the book of Daniel chapter seven is that if they understand that in Daniel chapter seven, that they that's another that, that's another witness that they could have not been under some impression that he was coming back in their time. I was not trying to run from Colossians at all. I'm, like I said, um, you you gave the scripture in uh, in Colossians chapter one verse twenty three. Okay, I'm going to read it here, and then I'm I'm going to have to go and uh, and, and research it uh, thoroughly um, in the Greek. I can't do it right now over the phone. I'm not disputing and say what you're saying is wrong over the phone. All I said that I need to go look it up in the Greek and and see what it said. That's all I said. Okay, cool, cool. I will say this. If you can't do that right now, can you at least do this? If if what I'm saying is correct, because if I'm not if what I'm saying isn't correct, we understand your stance. But if what I'm saying is correct, and Paul said, look, the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven of which I am of which I have been made a minister. What would that implicate towards, for, or against the argument that you're making as far as the man of sin goes? Well, that would make my argument of the gospel not being preached to every nation incorrect. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to know. Okay, cool. 
So, yeah, I'm done. Um, thanks, B.A. Thanks for letting me jump back in there right quick because I, I didn't want him to – I didn't know where he was going with that, but he said he just kind of side-noted that Daniel 7 thing, and we don't need to go there because, right, you know, that right there was just a little too much. All right. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. All yeah, right. Um, yes, sir. All right, there. Yeah, I just want to make sure that uh, that everybody else can speak too. Uh, Robert Reed, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, you know what, guys? Um, I, I just I just want to throw something in there, and I don't want to derail the conversation. So forgive me if it comes off that way. I don't. Um, but um, from what I see here, on one side, uh, one believes the uh, man of sin, the son of perdition, is an individual, and it sounds like the other side is saying that. It can be a collective, you know, of people. If I'm hearing that correct, uh, if I'm hearing that correct, I'd like to just go ahead and ask my uh, question. Now, I'm not choosing a side or anything. I'm just throwing something on the table and just, you know, I just want to see if you guys kind of kick it around a little bit on both sides, actually. Now, I understand we're going through our resources and, we, you know, we go through the Strongs and whatnot and the other resources and stuff like that. But I want to go in a little bit of a different direction. When we look at these scriptures like Revelation 19, we brought up Daniel 7, we brought up Daniel 11, we brought up, you know, uh, well, I don't know if anyone brought up 1 John, but we brought up Revelation 13, uh, 3, verse 5, all these different verses and stuff like that. I wanted, I wanted to bring those up to simply ask the question. When we look at some of these um, descriptions of what's traditionally used to describe the Antichrist, um, well, you know what, right before I ask my question, I'm just going to go to Daniel 11 just for a second. Daniel 11 uh, in 36 through 38, you know, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of God, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Now, of course, I'm reading out of the King James. 37, neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall shall magnify himself above all. Um, I'll go ahead and read 38 just for context. But in his state shall he honor the God of forces, and God whom his father knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So anyway, the reason why I bring that up is because when we look at this verse and we look at a few of the other verses that I mentioned, um, or like Revelation 13 and 3, it says, I saw one of his heads, and it was been mortally wounded, stuff like that. We know that the Bible uses a lot of symbolism, and we got to do some study to decipher some of the uh, symbolism. But my question is, in these verses, all the characteristics are pointing towards an individual. Now, that's not my conclusion. I'm just saying that, for instance, not regarding the God of his fathers, um, not regarding uh, women, so, you know, won't have a desire for women, um, leading an army, uh, people, you know, lending their power to him, and, and nations are following this individual and things like What I'm saying is that, I'm t- okay, I insert an individual, but nations following this son of perdition or antichrist or whatever you want to call it. So my question is, it seems as though the Bible is going out of the way in different verses to kind of, use language that suggests an individual. So I just wanted to see what you guys, you know, kind of uh, thought about that. And why is it that it's using language that's really suggesting like an individual, like a father, the God of his fathers, not desiring women, leading armies, things like that. Then I'll pass the mic. All right, whoever wants to address it, everybody, mic is open. Whoever wants to address it, go ahead. I'll, I'll say this right quick. This is Brother Zadok. Hey, peace, Brother Rob. Um, Daniel 11, I, I, the reason why I, I don't mind saying what I'm saying personally is because I don't. Daniel 11 has nothing whatsoever to do with anything in the new, that's written in the New Testament. Um, the book okay. of Daniel chapter 11, and, and, and because uh-huh. of that opinion, which you're reading about uh, 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 the king, uh, the king who would stand up in the latter times of the Greek Empire, and is that in the uh-huh. third? Um, that, as far as I understand, has nothing to do with um, whatever it is that we're talking about in Second Thessalonians, and so I wouldn't equate that with anything um, because that there's a whole story to who 
at least uh, my brethren and I, after years of research, have been able to come to the conclusion who that is. So I, I wouldn't argue with you about the things you read in Daniel 11. I'm just saying that they totally have nothing to do with um, the New Testament. Okay. Well, just for my own edification, who did you identify the figure in Daniel 11 to be? I don't want to be able to other conversations. I was just curious. Um, the whole uh, – that entire chapter is actually almost verbatim describing the wars between the Seleucid and Ptolemaic Empire. And in the latter times of the Greek Empire, after they had been in rule for almost 200 years after the death of Alexander, Antiochus Epiphanes stood up. And he actually, as far as we can find, and we actually have lessons on this in our, in our archives, he fit everything to the T, everything that he did. Um, not regarding the God of his fathers, he worshipped the God that his fathers had known by flatteries. He had done many deals and by flatteries had deceived many and made false peace treaties. And then you read about the wars where he goes and he fights against the king of the south, and then there's a marriage made between him and um and and, and the sister or the daughter of the uh, of the king of the south. Um, it's a lot there, but I'll just give you that in brief. So if I'm correct, okay. and that's if I'm correct, then. That has nothing to do with anything in the New Testament. Okay. No, that's a fair answer. That's a fair answer. Okay. And um, I would like to say this. If you really want to get some context on Daniel 11, you got to start in Daniel chapter 8. Because that's, okay. the, transition from the, that's the transition from the Medi Persians and the transition to the Greek Empire. Because we understand in the book of Daniel, those four kingdoms, which line up with Babylon, the Persians, the Greeks, which is under under Alexander, and after that, Rome. So, and when you read Daniel chapter 8, the prophet specifically gives us, uh, he, he specifically uh, gives us the, uh, the language and, let, let, and lets us know that it, was this, that it was the Persians who were in power in this vision that he saw, and there was a transition um, between the Persians and the Greeks, and, the, and we know history tells us that the Greeks, they destroyed the Persians, and the Persians were a third empire according to the image written in the prophet Daniel and the beast revealed okay. by the prophet Daniel. Uh, this is a short okay. I'd like to say something real quick, if, if I can answer uh, from another perspective or add. Sure. Um, the, the Bible has a lot of what you call, in the Greek word, anthropomorphisms. Um, uh, this, the human attributes, it's, it's like human form. Um, we're dealing with spirit. God is a spirit. Elohim is a spirit. Yahweh is the Lord. God is a spirit, right? So there's many elements of the spirit. Spirit has masculine traits or aspects and feminine traits or aspects or elements to it. And you're right. There's a lot of uh, words in the Bible that are used for symbolism to mean other things, ultimately spirit, right? So uh, uh, Israel. Israel is a group of people, right? But in Ezekiel 16, Israel is called the woman. Jerusalem is called the woman. Jerusalem is called the woman. So Jerusalem is a city and it's also called a woman. Now, in our mind, in, in, in our westernized mind, when we say man or woman, we, all, we always think of man or woman determined by their, you know, sexual reproductive organ parts. You know what I mean? But we... This, this thing is more spiritual where, we, where we're having to actually get things taught to us in the natural form, but ultimately to go to the layer of the spiritual. So the thing is that uh, a human being, which is flesh, a human being, which is flesh, can have spirit impressed upon it. And when you have spirit pressed upon it, that spirit can drive, that, that spirit is an energy or force, Right. That, that, that spirit, that energy or force could drive a, a, a human being to do all sorts of different elements, you know, because the spirit encompasses different elements, you know what I mean, of attributes. So the thing is, I think sometimes we, we, we see the literal stuff, but I think we have to know that the Father says he gives us natural things in order to understand the spiritual things. This thing is, 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 is spiritual. We have to get to that layer of the spiritual. I know I went all along there, but um, you're right. Um, in Revelation, there's a lot of symbolism, but the Father has to give us natural words, and then we we got to know, we got to go beyond those natural words to get to the spiritual, and I yield. 
Well, I, well, I agree. I agree with you um, that there's a lot of symbolism, um, especially in Revelation. I mean, I can certainly agree with you in that. Um, so, at the end of the day, are we saying, for instance, uh, because we, I'm just going to depart from Daniel right now and just go Revelation, for example, and just you know, touch a couple of places like Revelation, you know, 13 and 3. Uh, you know, and I saw one of his heads, and it has been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and thought after the beast. Now, I know we know a lot of times beast is symbolism, you know, with government and things like that. And then if we go, if we drop down to verse uh, 13 and 5, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months, so on and so forth, do we still relegate that to... Symbolism. So we're still not pointing to an individual. Is, is that what's going on here? Hey, I like to say this, um, peace, brother Rob. Um, once uh-huh. again, it's not that it's not that it doesn't mean. It's not that it's not literally explaining something, but it's right. all about what is it explaining. Like we have to we have to come to some kind of conclusion according to what we understand through the scripture. In historical context on what it is So I'll just tell you briefly As far as the head that was wounded And um, and, and, and it was given the power to, uh, 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 Everything that you just described Right It's just as It's, it's just as this bro it, What we have to be careful of is this The nation of Israel Was waiting for the prophet Elijah To come back literally Literally True. Yep they asked John the Baptist, are you the Christ? He said, no. They asked him, are you Elijah? He said, no. And then after his death, Yeshua says, the preaching of John, if you can't accept it, this was Elias or Elijah that everyone was waiting for to come. So my thing is this, like the brother Amiyan said, he said that Christ had opened up their understanding of the scriptures. How many there are many Israelites today who still reject Christ, and not only are, uh, who reject Yeshua as Messiah, not only are they waiting for another one to pop up, but they're still waiting for Elijah the prophet. So they've rejected Yeshua of Nazareth as being the true Messiah, and they rejected what he said, the Elijah who y'all been waiting for at the end of the book of Malachi, that one, that the very last verse you read, the Lord shall send Elijah the prophet before the dreadful and coming up day of the Lord. Now, if Elijah the prophet was to come before the terrible day of the Lord, and Jesus said that the preaching of John was that, what are we looking for actually in the context of the man of sin? Are we looking for an individual who is the pope every time a new pope comes? When John Paul II died, everyone was like, "Uh uh-oh, uh-oh, I think it's it. And here come Benedict. It was like, yo, do you know what his name means? Do you know what his history was? Everyone was yep. on pins and needles. I know dudes who had their airplane tickets on standby to flee to the wilderness somewhere. And then Benedict retires, and here comes Francis, and now he the nice pope who cool, in a, and, and he'll bust a nene for you, and, and he talk friendly to gay people, and they're like, oh, now everyone's morals are down, and they're waiting. So my thing is, when we look at these things in Revelation or in the book of Daniel or whatever, the book of Daniel as far as Daniel 11, Daniel's chapter 8 through 11, had nothing to do with the beast that had the seven heads and the ten horns or the second beast that came up after it out of the earth who had horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon and who actually helped heal the wound on that particular head you're speaking of. It does mean something. We're not, I don't, I'm not saying, and I don't believe my brother or my sister are saying, those don't literally mean something. But we can't do this. We can't take Daniel 7, Daniel 11, Revelation, whatever that chapter was, and Second Thessalonians and create a doctrine with them. And that's the danger of it. Well, I agree, I agree with it. I agree with it. And I understand that we have to, you know, reexamine tradition because obviously when we came out of, you know, Christianity, we have pretty much reexamined everything that we've been taught. So you guys, you know, you guys know, you know that. So I, I know we do have to reexamine everything. But at the same time, when you take something away from someone, because you know uh, that we've tra- traditionally been taught, you know, that, hey, the Antichrist is going to be this guy, that guy. Some people thought it was going to be 
Obama, some people, you know, you got the Pope, the papacy, I should say, because, uh, you know, it's one Pope after the other, so on and so forth. You know, some people thought Antichrist was well, Catholic, they thought Antichrist was, you know, Nero, and, you know, we, you know, we've done the history, we've done that. But what I'm saying is you take, some, you take something away. You say, okay, it's not Nero, it's not the papacy, it's not Obama or whoever. It, it, it's not these people. Okay, that's fine. Now, what people start to do, and I'm asking, you know, uh, you know, from like the audience perspective, is like the, 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 the obligatory question is going to be, but then who is it? Then who are we pointing to? Now, if, some, if people are saying, okay, it is the spirit of Antichrist, okay, it's not an individual person, it's the spirit that has come over everyone, you know, in their temple, in their body, you know, then that's Antichrist. But I haven't, unless I missed it because I did get on the phone a little late. And let, I didn't. I didn't hear anyone say, "Yeah, okay, it's not a person at all. It is just the spirit that's coming over in the temple of your body um, that's influenced the world or whatever." Or, "Hey, the, the Antichrist has already came and gone, or he is yet to come." I just haven't heard any definitive answer. And I'm not trying to pin anyone to the wall, but I'm just saying, if everything is up in the air, then this is almost like an exercise in futility. If we don't, you know, if we don't say, "Okay." This is what it is, and this is why I'm saying it is. So far, all I've heard is, well, this is why it is not. That, you know, that's all I've heard. And, I'm, you know, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful or anything like that. It's just that I know people on the call, when they walk away, if they walk away with no answer whatsoever, then they're like, well, okay, what just happened? You know, so that's what I'm saying. Okay, well, then what are we dealing with? I guess that's my question. What are we dealing with? Are we talking about an individual yet to come? He already came. Is it the spirit that's dwelling in us today? What what are we dealing with? And I'd just like to hear you guys answer on that. Well, I would say this. Um, this is what I would say. The thing is, is that, like I was saying earlier, we're, we're not trying to uh, attack anybody or make it seem like whoever's teaching this is wrong. We just think, we under, I understand it, and I could probably speak for the rest of those who may believe this as well, is that, we understand this to be deeper than it just being a Muslim or a Pope. So our thing is, is that when it comes to it, and this is what people identify the man as in as Antichrist. So uh, what I would do, um, I think my sis wanted to say something. Um, she, she wanted to uh, say something. She was trying to speak a little earlier, but she didn't get a chance to. So uh, go ahead, sis, if you want to um, share, share what you were trying to share. Uh, yeah, um, Brother Rob, peace to you. It's my first time uh, speaking with you. Uh, Thank you. Love your uh, I, I, I love your uh, <laughs> I love your Sabbath lessons, by the way. I, I, I listen yeah, to it a lot. Uh, but um, I wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to read a few verses just to kind of add to what you were saying or kind of um, give some perspective on what you're saying. Because I, I I think where you're trying to go is here. What what is Antichrist or all this stuff, right? First uh, John chapter two. First John chapter two. First um, John chapter two. I'm going to read a bit to, to give some context. Verse 18, I'm going to read from Scripture's ISR. It says, little children, usually that means disciples, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the anti-Messiah is coming, even now many anti-Messiahs have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. They went from us. But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have stayed with us. But in order that it might be made manifest that none of them were of us, right? Um, let's get down to verse 22. It says, who is the liar except the one denying that Yeshua is the Messiah? This is the anti messiah the one denying the Father and the Son. No one denying the Son has the Father. The one confessing the Son has the Father as well. Let me read the next verse, and then I'm going to go to Revelation 12 for you. I, I think I see what you're getting at. Second uh, John, Second John in this one chapter, Second John, verse 7, says, because many who are leading astray, you know, apostasy, right, leading astray, went out into the world who do not confess Yeshua, Messiah, or Jesus, Messiah, as coming in the flesh. This one is he who is leading astray and the anti-Messiah. Now, when it says this one is he who is leading astray, first of all, let me let me say this before I go to Revelation 12. When we, we when we call um, 
God, when we, we, we call the Lord God, or, you know, whatever name we want to use for him. We call him a he. But yeah. the Lord God is a spirit, right? But when we call the yeah. Lord God the spirit a he, we're not saying it's an individual with a male reproductive organ. You see what I'm saying? It's a general term. It's a pronoun. We say he. Yeah. That's, what, that's what we best have in our English vernacular. Okay? So I just wanted to put that out there. And then let's go to Revelation 12. So it says, this one is he who is leading astray. Now, this one is like uh, that, that word in the Greek, uh, uh, I believe it means deceiver, right? So let's go to Revelation 12, the deceiver. Revelation 12, verse 9. It says, then the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who leads all the world astray. What is Satan? Satan is the deceiver. Satan is the accuser. Satan is the adversary. Satan is the spirit, right? Right. He was thrown to the earth. Now, when I say he, it's, it's a pronoun. You know, it's not necessarily saying this he means it's a male or a man, right? He says he was thrown to the earth, and his messengers were thrown out with him. So I, I just wanted to add that to the mix there. So I, I think, you know, just to get some proper context of where you're going, I, I think that would uh, suffice to say, you know, it'll, it'll help us get somewhere. But in first, in second, excuse me, in Second Thessalonians chapter two, we stop at verse four, but we don't read all the way down to uh, verse uh, twelve. You know what I mean? I think that would give us some more context about lawlessness and who's this spirit or energy or driving force or power that right. getting people or to do or who's driving this mindset. Right. That's 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 what I want to say. I yield for now. Okay. Thank thank you, sister. I appreciate your input on that because um that's that's the reason why you know I joined the panel because I wanted to get you know the insight from all the brothers on the panel and, and you too, sister. Um and you know and I do appreciate that. That's why I didn't come, you know, uh, combative or anything like that. But you know I just wanted to kind of get perspective, you know, on that. I mean, Brother Zadok, you know, he was giving me a different perspective on Daniel, basically from, you know, chapter 7 all the way through 11. So I appreciate that. And then the other brother, um, or expect. Yeah, just one thing, I just wanted to kind of get the panel's uh, perspective on it too. Um, on, in First John 2 and 18, okay, uh, you had read something. You said, little children, it is it is the last hour, and as ye have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and, uh, you know, it's uh, capitalized in the, in, in the King James, Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists, small a, have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. My point of bringing that part back up is that the the distinction was made. In the context, it was saying, okay, well, there is – the Antichrist, okay, something, you know, in particular, the Antichrist, like as an individual in that case, and then as it goes on, even now many Antichrists, plural, so multiple, and I understand that any of us can be Antichrist. Anybody who's against Messiah is an Antichrist, so I, so I get that. But they made a distinction between the Antichrist and many Antichrists. So I was just wondering if someone can kind of help reconcile that understanding in first John two eighteen. You said first John two eighteen? Yes, sir. Okay, let me see. Let me get to it. Yeah, because it, it does it does uh two and eighteen yeah, it does say that. Little children, it is the last time and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now there were many Antichrists where probably know that it's the last time. Now this is just me. Like I said I'm a student I learn, and I'm learning. So my thing is, is that when I read this, we have to remember we had Antichrist in the days of the Messiah when he was on earth. You had the Sanhedrin, which consists of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and many of those who denied him and who lied and lied on him and had him crucified. So we can, I, I will hope that we can agree that those were Antichrist. Those are the many, and I'm not saying that they fit the whole thing, but that is, a, is an example, an example of Antichrist to many. And I'm pretty sure when Paul was teaching, the apostles were teaching, there were individuals they were encountering who had a problem with them teaching this individual by the name of Yeshua or Jesus the Christ or whichever you prefer to call him. So that's, that, yeah. those are the many. 
You know what I'm saying? Now, when it says, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Okay. So the thing is, is that I would, I understand this as that's, man, that, that's, that's a good question that you brought out. I would say this would either have to be, hmm, let's see, that Antichrist shall come. So that means, and that could either mean that could be a spirit in Antichrist. It could be a spirit because like, like my uh, sister was just saying, just because, I mean, it's that Antichrist, it doesn't necessarily mean that it could be a literal human being. It could also be a spirit, you know what I'm saying? Or it could also be this this type of, uh, it, could, it could mean, and like I said, I, I don't know everything. I'm still learning. So my thing is sure. when, it, when it's capital, when it's capital is Antichrist, I still see that this could be the systematic rule of oppression on the world. Uh, how humanity has lost touch, you know what I'm saying? So that's when I leave, read that, that's how I look at it, you know what I'm saying? I yield. Okay. I understand. I appreciate your honesty, brother. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something, Zadok. I just want to let the audience know, like, in the next maybe 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to allow y'all to ask y'all questions. I see you pressing number one already. I see y'all. <laughs> We're going to get to y'all like 20 minutes. All right, so press number one and stand by. Z-Dog at. No, but, but before I get to running my trap and get out of control, the brother, I'm in, uh, 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 I believe his name is Amiyan. Um, I believe he's on here too. So if he has an opinion on this, I would like to hear you. Because brother Rob, he said I'm asking, you know, you guys on the panel. And he's here, so I definitely would like to hear um, him uh, address brother Rob along with the rest of us. Hello, am I on? Yeah, we can hear you, bro. Yeah, you good. You loud and clear. You good. Okay, I want to go a little bit backwards and I just um Matthew chapter twenty four, just want to bring up a point for the for the sake of um of things to make sense. So there's no really there, there, there is no contradiction. Matthew twenty four verse fourteen where I read Um and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. The brother Zadok went to first I mean went to Colossians one twenty three and said that this happened already. If that happened already, as Christ says here in Matthew he says, then shall the end come. So if that happened in the apostles' time, the end should have came. We are almost two thousand years removed from that and the end have not came yet. But Christ's word says that when that happened, it says then shall the end come. So it it kinda seems if 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 Paul if what Paul is saying is correct the end should have came according to what Christ says here in Matthew. There is can be some kind of a contradiction or offset there that is that is not lining up with the words of Christ here in Matthew because the end didn't come if that actually happened. Okay? Just I'm bringing out just to just to stuff just to make sense of what the scriptures are saying, starting first with our Lord's words. As far as Daniel is concerned, I think the brother Zadok said that Daniels have nothing to do with the the New Testament or the Renewed Testament or Revelation. I want to go in here and show you that it does. And to clear up the mistake the brother made about the beast uh, in Daniel chapter 8. In Daniel chapter 8, it says that uh, the Persian and Mede Empire is a ram. It calls it a ram with two horns. It's a Pacific animal. It calls it a ram. Now, none of the animals in the seventh chapter is a ram. Not one of them. Now, the, the, the Bible uses these animals to, to identify nations. It does not use two different animals to, to identify one nation. So the, uh, the Persian and Mean Empire, according to the 8th chapter of Daniel, is a ram. The Grecian is a goat. There is no ram and no goat in the 7th chapter of Daniel. So that means that these animals here in the 7th chapter cannot be the Persian and Mede, can, cannot be the, uh, the, the Greek Empire. Okay, because those are specifically named as two different animals. Okay, now in Daniel chapter 7, I want to read verse 12 to show you that uh, the Babylonian, Persian, and Mede, Greek, and Romans all ruled in succession. They did not rule at the same time. It was one after the other. Daniel chapter 7, verse 12 says, As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. How can that be possible? How can their lives be prolonged for a season of their time if these nations, if these kingdoms in the past all ruled in succession? This is telling you that these beasts here 
was ruling on the earth all at the same time. So it cannot be those kingdoms in the past. It must be these four kingdoms that's going to rule at the same time on the earth, again, which I say has not happened. And in this same chapter here in Daniel chapter 7, it goes on to talk about uh, the saints taking the kingdom. After these four beasts here are taken down, uh, taken away, it, it goes on to speak about the saints taking the kingdom. So this is speaking of the end time when these when these beasts are on the earth, and when these beasts lose their power, it speaks of the saints taking the kingdom. This is speaking of the end time in here. Okay, now I'm going to show you where, again, Daniel chapter 7 does link up with Revelations. When you look at the four beasts in Daniel chapter 7, when you look at the lion, the leopard, the bear, and the other uh, the other beast is not really mentioned. When you put those four beasts together, you get seven heads and ten horns. The exact same beast that is spoken of in Revelations chapter 13. I'm gonna read it. The the second beast of Daniel he has four heads, and the other three beasts make seven heads when you pull them all together. Now let me read Daniel chapter 13 to show you. Not Daniel, uh, not Daniel chapter 13, the book of Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. It speaks of all these four beasts accumulating in one animal. It's going to have all these animals here in this one beast. It says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. The last beast in Daniel, he had ten horns on his head. When you put all those four beasts together, this is the beast that you're seeing here. It says, and, uh, it says, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. That's the second beast in Daniel chapter 7. It says, and his feet was like unto a bear. That's the second beast in Daniel chapter 7. I mean, that's the second beast. The leopard is the third beast. I made a mistake. It says, and his mouth... As as and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. That's the first beast in Daniel chapter seven. Is all those four beasts are being accumulated in one because the Antichrist, which comes out of the fourth beast, he conquered those other three nations and put them into one. This is what we are reading here in the book of Revelation chapter thirteen, and it goes on to speak of this man here, and in the seventh verse. It says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kinds and tongues and nations. In Daniel chapter 21, it says the exact same thing. Daniel chapter 21, I'm going to read it. Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 7, verse 21 is what I mean to say. It said the same thing about this little horn. He does the same thing to... Uh, the saints of the Most High. Daniel chapter 7, verse 21. It says, And I beheld the same, and I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So he says it's the same thing here in the book of Revelation. So both of these things here link up together. And when you put it in a chronological order, the things are speaking here of a particular man making war with the saints, and this is the man that sits in the temple of God, saying that he is God, because in the 11th chapter of Daniel, at the end of it, it says, verse 45, Daniel 11, verse 45 says, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas. That is the Mediterranean and uh, the Jordan. It says, in the glorious holy mountain, which is talking about the land of Jerusalem. It says, yet he shall come to his end, and none, sh and none shall help him. So it's clear that he's going to set up a temple or his palace in Jerusalem. Obviously, this has not happened yet. That's why I'm saying this is our future. And I yield. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay, cool. Um, yo. Not to be, well, this is kind of funny, but you kept saying Daniels. It's, it's just Daniel. That I don't, that just kept bothering me. But I, I feel um, I feel where you went. Um, I think you may have confused what was being said. That's why I, I was like, uh, you know, I wanted to hear what you had to say, at least on what Brother Rob was asking. But you went, you went back to the very beginning, which is cool because you really hadn't spoke that much. I never said anything about Daniel 7 not having anything to do with Revelation. I said that 
that Brother Rob asked about the king of fierce countenance in Daniel chapter 11. And I see you brought it up at the end. Now, I don't think that what you're reading in Daniel 7 in the fourth beast has anything to do with whoever we're speaking of in Daniel chapter 11, because the individual in Daniel chapter 11 actually comes out of the Greek empire. It, I mean, it's, it's just self-explanatory that that empire had the one great king. He died and four kings stood up in his place and there was war between them. And in the latter time of their kingdom, one rose among them. So this is talking about the Greeks. As far as the animals go, my bro, it's just like it's just like Nebuchadnezzar being shown in one vision a tree that represented him in his kingdom. And then in another vision, he was shown himself as a head of gold who was on top of the Colossus. So that's like saying, well, the tree in Daniel chapter uh, 4 is not the same thing as the head of gold in Daniel chapter 2. So don't get confused in the context of the ram and the he goat with the big horn that gets chopped off and the ram with the one, the ram with two horns, one bigger than the other. It's just another way of explaining it because what the Lord does in scripture is he establishes what's going to happen by two witnesses. And so what he was doing was he was explaining again particulars and he showed them as different. I said that Daniel's 8 through 11 which deal with the Persian and Greek empires and whatever is in there have nothing to do with anything we're reading in the New Testament, and I do stand by that. As far as what you showed in Daniel 7, I just made the comment when you said that Christ showed the disciples that he opened their understanding of the scriptures, and you, were, you, you implied that they didn't understand Daniel chapter 7 already. I don't agree with that, and you were saying that them four beasts hadn't even been revealed yet. I don't agree with that, but I never even brought that up again. Um, Brother Rob, as far as what you asked um, uh, 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 in First John about the Antichrist, I'm under the impression that that was simply uh, – um, I'm under the impression that that was simply saying, hey, you have been – little ones, you have been told that the, that, uh, that, that the Antichrist shall come. What is the Antichrist? This is what's interesting. We would have to, it, there could only be two explanations in my opinion. One is he was, John, in his letter to a group of people, was referring to Paul's letter, to his second letter to the Thessalonians. We have no proof of that because outside of that text, there is no other letter of any apostle that you're going to read anything close to a man of sin, a Antichrist. Like what? Is it James' letter? Is it either one of Peter's letters? Is it John's letters? Or is it Paul's other letters? Like what? The only thing that we would have to conclude is when John said what he said, he was saying, y'all heard about the Antichrist that Paul taught everybody about. We would have to kind of intimate that. But I don't think that that's necessarily the case because I'm under the impression that who John was talking to in his letter was in Hebrew audience anyway. Paul and Barnabas okay. were, were, were the apostles to the Gentiles. John, James, and Andrew were in charge of the circumcision. So even when we read First John, I am under the impression, I could be wrong, that he, he was writing to the, you know, to the Hebrew portion of the body of Christ. And my thing is, did, did Jesus teach about Antichrist? The only Antichrist we find if we want to use Matthew 24, Mark 13, or Luke 21, in my opinion, is when he said, many shall come deceive you, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. That itself is antichrist. So when, right. but you heard that would come. Well, when did they hear it would come? It would either be from something Jesus and the apostles taught, or that what we're talking about tonight, which this is based on uh, Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. I'm under the impression that simply they were being brought back to, you've heard of what was going to come to the church, which was going to be against Christ. Because we can look at the Antichrist as an individual or the Antichrist being the spirit that Christ said would come into the church. Because this is coming into the church. It's not an outside force that that, that is so monolithic. It's coming and you don't see it, or, or, or you see it, and you're ready to stand and fight against it. No, in the midst of you, there's something that's going to happen, and what is that? Those who are going to come saying, I am exactly who the nations was waiting for, but they're going to use that, and they're going to deceive. And so whether it was Paul, 
I mean, I'm sorry, whether it was Alexander the Coppersmith in Paul's letters, um, um, uh, uh, um, Onemus and others, these guys who are coming saying the resurrection has already passed and other things, they are a part of what he was saying. He said, y'all heard Antichrist going to come? Man, many Antichrists have showed themselves, and because of this, we know that we're in the last time. And so I will also, um, in my last, in closing, I'll, I'll push this back on, um, on Brother Aminyan. If the, if the writer of the letter says to the brethren, many Antichrists are here, so we know this is the last day. How is it that even though you can look at, you say we're 2,000 years removed from the time that stuff was written, when it was written, the writer called the very time it was being written the last day. So, so, so I think when we get talk about the end, we, we can make last days like, I don't know, like the last two years, but two or three, 4,000 years could be like, this is the last days of mankind in this whole struggle between good and evil, what the Lord is going to do. So I just want to put that in the air. I'll shut my mouth now so that Sal can go and uh, bring the people in. I just want to ask the brother, um, where is your proof? And, and to clear up, I had mentioned Daniel chapter 8 when it was talking about the goat and um and the other in the um in the kingdom between the Medes and Pers- Persians. So uh that was me who mentioned Daniel chapter eight and if you read it historically, that's talking about and I mean that's I, I forget which specific animals it talks about. But I know based on the context, it was a war between the Greeks and the Medi Persians. And then in Daniel chapter eight is the transition from the Medes being defeated by the Persians because it says that the animal came up swiftly. So we understand that to be Alexander the Great and his empire destroying the Medi Persians. But I want to ask the brother too: Where is your proof? Your proof that it is the Pope, that the man is here that takes this temple. And, and, and then one thing about it: According to the doctrine of the apostles, the word nails. If you look in the Strong's, it keeps saying that according to the doctrine of the apostles, what they taught, they meant a metaphorical temple. So are we not reading the apostles right now? Paul is an apostle. So the language that Paul is using, he is talking about nails, the figurative temple. It can mean it can mean building structure, but based on the context on how Paul was using it, I understand and I see that he was talking about a figurative temple. So and and so uh, and I'll bring that out and I just want to run that by anybody and even the callers they want to call me on it, that's fine. But I want to ask the brother. Where is your proof that it is a pope? I never said it was the pope, so I don't, I don't, I don't know where you where you asking me that question for. I, I've, I've never stated anywhere that uh, that is the pope. All I'm saying that there is a man coming, a man of sin, versus what you're saying that it can be anybody. And as far as okay. you, as far as, as as far as you addressing um, in in Daniel's, um, you have not proven. That any of those beasts in Daniel chapter seven is any of those kingdoms in the past. You just making speculation. Well, you know what I'm saying? So I, nowhere I, I, in the I, I, Bible. I, I, let me finish, bro. Nowhere in the Bible does the scriptures does the, the, the scriptures identify the same nation as two different animals. It doesn't do that. It is consistent oh. with that nation being that specific animal. So if you're saying that one of those animals in the seventh chapter. Uh, the bear is the Persian and Mede, and then in the eighth chapter it said that it's a goat. That's inconsistency. It's two different animals. The Bible don't the Bible okay. don't don't work like that. And again, as far as the as far as the 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 Greek grammar, as I looked it up, is uh, in in Thessalonians uh, chapter two verse three, the first man when it says let no man deceive you, that first man in the Greek is the Greek word tis. Which would make sense as far as you being deceived, not being deceived by anybody, by nobody, by no one. And the, the second man in that verse, the man of sin, is the Greek word anthropos, which is talking about a human being. That's what I looked up. That's what it showed me that the first man, the Greek word is tis, and the second man, Greek word is anthropos. Okay. No, well, I, I would suggest that you go back and um, 
when it comes to those beasts and Daniel, um, it's obvious from what I from what I just heard from you that you are under the impression that those beasts have not come yet. If you read in that same chapter, the prophet reveals that reveals those um those kingdoms and um and and, and the no, thing is, is that where is it? Oh, he does it. Okay, Where is hold, on. All right, yeah, hold, hold on. on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, that based based on his, historically, historically, you know what I'm saying? Those kingdoms came because the first kingdom was. Uh, if you yeah. hold on, first I would I would suggest you go back and read Daniel chapter two before you jump into Daniel chapter seven. But my point is, is that when it comes to the man, I mean, as it being an actual male, the word is four four two, anthropinos. Anthropos it consists of male and female, but you're saying that it's a man, so you're 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 incorrect as well. I can admit to my mistakes, but you're incorrect as well. So if 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 Paul was talking about an actual male, he would have used the word anthropinos, not anthropos. That's if he specifically was talking about a male with a private part, and you know what I mean. Now you. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you respond, Amayan, and uh, I'm gonna let Shanti respond too. And then we gotta go to the audience. We gotta get some audience time. Okay, do I speaking, guys? Hey, Sal. Okay. No, I just wanted to say to the brother Amayan that I think, I think that it would do him well to be careful to say what the Bible doesn't do. Even God's own nation is referred to as a son and as a wife. So. Is, is, is it one or is it the other? In Daniel chapter 2, Babylon is talked about as the, the Grecian Empire is shown as silver or brass, and then in another text is described as an animal. You just got to be careful in saying that the Bible wouldn't take the kingdom and it wouldn't describe it as um, as two different animals because um, – the implication is, is that the Lord only speaks it one way, but the Lord usually does things in pairs because, as Paul said in Second Corinthians chapter 3, he said, this third time am I writing unto you as it is written, let every word be established by two or three witnesses. So the Lord in Daniel said what he said about the nations twice. And I think you might be missing that because he had to establish it the same way that Pharaoh had two dreams. One dream was corn and another dream was cows. But both dreams meant what? The Lord was establishing. And Joseph told Pharaoh that this was done twice, but it showed up two different ways. The Lord is establishing that this is going to happen. So the scripture does always do that. And I just wanted you to be careful in saying that the Lord wouldn't show one kingdom to be two different things, but yet be talking about that same one thing. The scripture does that over and over again. I just wanted to share that. If you don't accept it, that's cool, but I just wanted to share that. Okay. What? Okay. Well, let me say what I said, because I didn't say what you said just now. What I said was that the Bible don't call the same nation by two different animals. I'm talking about animals here. You're talking about something totally different that I never mentioned. Okay, if I'm wrong, go into the Bible and show me where it speaks of that same nation and call that same nation by two different animals. Now, here in Daniel chapter 7, when you read the first verse, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, he is the last king of the Babylonians. Okay? That means that Nebuchadnezzar has been dead long time ago. He's been dead. Now, when he read on down, it says that these beasts was, was coming out of the water, coming out, meaning they're coming up. Why in the why in the reign of Belshazzar is talking about these beasts coming up when Nebuchadnezzar, the, 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 the first king of Babylon, have been dead for over 50 years? Can't be talking about him because he's been dead. He can't be that first, that first, that, that lion, that first animal, because he talks about this animal coming up, not being dead already. So that, that immediately eliminates Nebuchadnezzar immediately. Again, and when you read, when I don't have time to go over every single beast, but I can go into every single beast uh, here in Daniel chapter 7, and what it says about them, it absolutely fit nothing of the Babylonians, Persian and Medes, Grecians, or Roman Empire. Don't fit none of them whatsoever. Okay? And again, I already read here in Daniel chapter 7, verse 12, which no one has addressed. It says, as concerning the rest of the beasts, 
they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. How can their lives be prolonged for a season and a time when these kingdoms in the past ruled consecutively? These bees here are ruling at the same time. That's why their dominion was taken away, but their lives, all the, the, the last three, was prolonged for a season and a time. How can their lives be prolonged for a season of their time if the kingdoms in the past ruled consecutively? It, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Their lives could not be prolonged because they ruled consecutively. Hey, bro, you said no one answered the question. You're actually reading a text where two of the nations, Daniel was in, Daniel, the other three nations ain't even been revealed yet. That was the, Daniel said that he had that vision during the reign of Belshazzar, my brother. Persia, Greece, and Rome haven't even, haven't even come on. Well, Persia exists, but it hasn't taken over yet. And Greece and Rome doesn't even exist. So when Daniel is being shown these visions, he, he's being shown where he's at and what's to come. That's the, I mean, that's so simple. I uh, say that. Uh, hold, that, that. Hold, hold that thought. Hold, hold that thought, man. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta let Ashanti say something. We gotta, we gotta get the audience some time. Write it down, though. Write it down. We got, we got an hour and eight. We got an hour and eight minutes to address whatever we, you know, whatever we need to address. Again, the number is three one nine five two seven six two three nine. Shanti, and then the audience. That is Shanti. All right, real quick, um, real quick. I think we're getting um, the the Greek words misconstrued here a little bit. Um, the word for son. Um, in the Greek, in Second Thessalonians chapter three, we're talking about the son of perdition. Um, it's a uh, Greek G five two zero seven, and it's uh, huias, huias, right? And in the context there, it means descendant. Okay, and it means descendant, or um, what is it here? Let me let me, let me read it to you. A descendant. It, it means uh, it's, it's used widely of immediate, remote, or figurative kinship, like a child. You know how sometimes it says the nay Israel? It doesn't necessarily mean males of Israel, but it also can mean children of Israel, right? So, and, and, and it's also used of, of animals, that word there. So when you said it's specifically a male with a male reproductive organ, that word son of perdition there, that son is not necessarily saying it's specifically a male, M-A-L-E. And like Brother B.A. said, um, he, he read the other Greek words that mean specifically male and specifically man. Those are not in Second those are not in Second Thessalonians chapter three. But I want to read something um here. Uh first Corinthians let me not read it. First Corinthians three and first Corinthians six. Um Paul says, Don't you know that your body is the temple? And the temple is flesh, and our flesh houses spirit. Okay, I think we need to keep that in mind. When when Yeshua or Jesus roamed the earth, he was fleshly, but he was spirit made flesh. You know what I mean? So we have to understand these things and to go back. Elohim was a spirit. Male and female are humankind or human being. Human being was made in the image and likeness of the spirit. Which is God. So I think you got to understand those things. So I, I, I yield. Uh, bring the people in. All right, family, this is your time. This is your time. If you have any questions or comments, you know that number by now. 319-527-6239. Call via phone. Call via Skype. I see you have maybe I see you have two people that press number one. We have a lot of listeners, though, on the phone line. Again, people, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to press number one, and we'll add you to the conversation. Let's go to the first person. 716-541. You're live in there. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I wanted to say that it does make a difference at times what edition that you are reading it in, but I have to go with my brother. What my brother said earlier, it was getting a little uh, confusing. We should let the Bible speak for itself. Now, if in the American Standard Version, they say the the man of, of lawlessness or the lawless one. But when Paul speaks of it, he says the son of perdition. 
And we can read that in John 17 um, and 12. And it says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in my name. Those that gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And I have to agree with the brother that the son of perdition is is not a system. It, It is a person. It is a man. And we read that in Genesis three and fifteen when it talks about the seed of the of of of, of the of the woman and um, the seed of the devil. So it, it is not a system. It is definitely a, a a person, and it is the antichrist. But what he does is give his power to those people that you were back and forth arguing with those federations, you know. But he just sits back. But it's the Antichrist, like he said, the Antichrist was working in Christ's day. But the one, the son of perdition in this book, he is a man, and he is the seed of that woman. And the only place I read is twice about the son of perdition. And and Jesus talks about it when he refers to Judas as the son of perdition. And the scripture also says that Judas went. To his place Now where is his place Is his place hell It's a man It's not a sister Thank you I, I would uh, just like to respond yes, yes, yes. Um, if, if, if you were listening To what my sister my sister Shining when she was displaying the word son in the Greek It's not a speci- It says descendant Does not specifically say as a male Or a female we're dealing with the language in Greek which the New Testament was written in, my sis. I just want to clarify that to you. That's it. it you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's open. It's open. I mean, yeah, Judas, he, the Messiah was talking about Judas and John, what you just read. But guess what? Paul is not talking about the, the word also can, it's open to female as well. It means descendant are not men and female descendants. Okay, but but That's, but not in that con- but in the context of John, it, it's not what you're talking about. It's in its context. It's already in its context. But the word means descendant. It can be male or female. So when the Messiah was talking about that son of perdition, yes, he was talking about that that word son. Yes, it can, it can be male. So in properly, he's talking about Judas because we understand Judas to be the son of perdition at that time. We're talking about Paul. Now we're dealing with context again. The, the word okay, but, son has, okay, but, but have you ever have you ever heard of uh you said at that time. So therefore we, we we've not seen another. Am I correct? No, we um have we not seen another yet? We yeah, there's plenty of yeah, plenty of sons of perdition. There's plenty no, of them. No, no, no. Those that no, speak, no, those no, who speak against the Messiah is place. a son of destruction. The scripture said that Judas went to his place. Explain that to me. He went to the he went to the grave. That's what hell means, grave. Can you, that's what it means? He's dead. There's no there's no proof that there's a place called hell with a guy with horns and fire. You can't physically prove that. I, I, hell just I, I, means I, I, the grave. I didn't, I didn't say that. I did not say that. Okay. I okay, then he went to his he went to his place. Where is his place at? His place is in hell. Of the grave. Shilo. Right? I was I'm not quite familiar with that term. I mean, is that the Hebrew term for, for the grave or is that Hebrew? But, well, yes. It, it says it in the Bible. It don't give you the it says Shilo. It don't give you the English. It says Shilo. Okay, then I will I will understand that to be the grave. All right, well, that's where I, that's what I'm saying. It, it, it's it's a it's a it's 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 a man. It's not a system. It's 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 going to be a man in Genesis three and fifteen. It tells you that Christ was born of a Virgin Mary through the Holy Spirit. Son of perdition, gonna be born through a woman. Of a woman, God. What is I, he? I would, I, I would just say I, I think you have lost. I think you don't understand the point I'm making, but I you. Well, no, it, it, you have not proven that it's it's um it's not a one individual. You have not proven that. 
Hey, if I, I, I don't, it, sis, sis, if you don't understand it, that's on you. I just heard, I just made a whole it's thing. Not fair, it's not fair for you to tell me that I only, that I don't understand. I, I, it's your job to make me understand. No, I hey, not my uh, job to make you believe I, anything. Hey, 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 maybe I can help. Um, um bless you, sister. Um, I, I, I wanted to share the 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 the, the concept of what kind of. Okay, is anyone on? My phone is. I can't Hello? hear. Hello. 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 Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Here. Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, we're still Sal. on. I think something's going on, maybe with the bait talk for you. At least we gotta find Sal. Sal. I think it's something wrong with the debate talk for you, uh, radio show yeah, line. I, I, yeah, I think something happened. Okay, but um, we, um, we can still go. My my my, yeah, my just, thing, sis, is okay. No, that's go, go ahead. Now, go no, ahead, brother. Keep going. going. Keep going. All I was just saying, the sun, predict the sun doesn't necessarily mean it can be used for male or it can be used for female descendant. So in the context of the Messiah was talking about, the definition of the word could be used for male or female. And then the Messiah was able to point out somebody because we know Judas was the one who betrayed him. And then when Paul was talking about it, that because he said that man of sin is, yet has not yet been revealed unless the fallen away. So what Paul is saying is sort of perdition. So until this individual or until this thing, Hello? Hello? I was still Hello? here. Thing is, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm here, sis. I'm here. Uh, B.A., are you still okay, there, well, brother? I, I, wanted, I wanted to respond to what he was saying because in, in John 6, chapter 6, verse 70 and 71, and it says, Jesus answered them, I have not chosen the 12, and one of you is a devil. He speaks of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he for he was that the one that should betray him, being one of the twelve. He called him a devil. Three right. To 15. So, sis, let, let me ask you this, sis, sis: Do you think the devil is a literal person, or do you think the devil is a spirit? Yes, the devil is a literal person, sis, and that's what you're supposed to be um, teaching people. You're not supposed to be teaching him. That, that that he is a person. He is real. He is a personage. Okay, I I, so I, I definitely I, I I understand your mindset. I understand your mindset. I, but I I got your perspective, Lauren. I just wanted to get that understanding of where your mindset was. Well, no, it, it but um it it it's a man. It, it it's the anti it, antichrist, but it is a man. It is the son of perdition. We just have to go with what the Bible says. And yo, you guys were saying a lot about stuff being in Greek. But originally, do you believe the New Testament was written originally in the Greek, or do you do you believe it was originally written in the English language? The he, the, the Bible was written in Hebrew, translated from Greek to English. Now, the reason why it was translated into Greek because the forefathers had lost their, um, we lost the language. So in order for us to come back to the language, because we were oh all scattered, they written it in Greek. That's history. That's history. I ain't make it up. You can. That's history. It was written in. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. I, I, I can hear you. I I I I, I, yeah. yield, I yield. I mean, I I understand the sister's yeah, I, perspective, I, and, and I, I respect the sister's. I respect the sister's perspective. Um, we're just putting out different perspectives, and we're just putting out the information, and we want the Holy Spirit to lead and guide into all truth. Um, people are going to believe what they want to believe. It's the Holy Spirit that actually convicts people to believe what they're going to. So we're just putting out the information. I'm not here to say anybody's right or wrong. I'm just here to put out the information, and hopefully the Holy Spirit pricks you uh, to, to, to lead and guide into all truth. I hear you. Yeah, like I know Blog Talk Radio locked me out. <laughs> So I'm back in there. It was crazy. But uh, hey, I think that, uh my car had dropped. My car got dropped. Yeah, call out. Yeah, man. I don't know if I'm brief moment there. Everybody just got locked out. So I don't know. But I'm back in. 
And uh, let's get to the next caller, though. Let's go to 470-572. You're live in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Swarman. Yeah, I want to say this, right? When we read the Bible, when you read uh, Second Thessalonians, it alludes to who it's talking about. It's as clear as day. Watch this. This is uh, Second Thessalonians 2, verse 7. It says, for the mystery of iniquity do already work, right? And the reason why Paul said that, because who was in power during this time, the Roman Empire. Then it says, only he who now let him will let until he be taken out the way. Then it says, and then, this is the key how we know who it's talking about. It says, and then shall that wicked be revealed. This is talking about the future. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. So Christ is going to consume this person or this people with his mouth, right? And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So when Christ returns, he's going to destroy this people that Paul is talking about. Now, this is going to jet propel us to Revelation 19. Here it is, Revelation 19, verse 11. It says, and I saw heaven opened up. This is what happened is when Christ ascended back up to the heavens, he, was take, he took this book out of the hands of the Most High, which contained seals. These seals contain present, 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 past, and future prophecies of the Bible. And it also had him coming back, returning, and judging the earth in these uh, seals. Now watch this. Revelation 19.11. And I saw heaven open up, behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doeth judge and make war, right? Then it says, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. This is talking about Christ. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, right? And his name is called the Word of God. So the question is, who in the Bible was prophesied they were going to have, he was going to have their blood on his clothing? Now, everybody in the Bible should be talking in sync with the Messiah. All the prophets should be talking what the Messiah is talking about, okay? Now, let's see who the blood that, uh, whose blood is going to be on the Messiah's clothes when he comes back and make war. Here it is. This is Isaiah, verses 63 and 1. It tells us. This is who it's talking about in Thessalonians. Here it is. Who is this that cometh from Edom with his dyed garments from Bodra, this that is glorious in his apparel? This is... Isaiah the prophet talking about Christ. Then it says, traveling in the greatness of his strength when he come back and judge the earth. It says, I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat. This is what was asked. Okay, this is the prophecy of Revelation 19. Okay, it said, eat him. That's what it's talking about. This is who Christ is going to get blood on his clothes, the blood of Edom. Now, we know, according to prophecy, Edom was prophesied he was going to get the meaning of the earth. He was going to get, be given the uh, sword, and it tell you in second, Thessalonians, in second Ezra that Edom was going to be the race that was going to be in the end time. This, that's who it's talking about, Edom, nobody else. And not everybody could fit that prophet. Edom is also the one that had the meaning of the earth. The earth is given it to the hands of the wicked. So that's who it is. It's, it's clear. But I just want to say that. I'll pass the mic. Hey, yo, if I could, um, hey, what a, and, um, yeah, that right there, bro, yeah, that was trash. I, look, 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 that right there, everything you read, like the Lord coming from Basma, Basra and Tina, that, 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 that in itself has nothing to do with what you read in the book of Revelation. In, 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 in Second Thessalonians, when it talks about he shall come and, and slay that wicked, I mean, Isaiah chapter 11 tells you that. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So when we look at, even when we look at the phrase, the man of sin, see, this is what I believe even the rabbis used to do, which I believe there's a Hebrew phrase that goes, uh, uh, Shanti can correct me, but it goes something along the lines of like, tokrit soferim. It, it stands for inundation of the scribes. And sometimes the scribes, whether Christian or not, who are, who are making copies of, of the sacred scriptures, sometimes they inundate their belief or the conclusion that they come to in the text. So I'll give you an example. We know that the Most High said in Exodus chapter 6, he said that the, he, said he appeared unto the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. He said, 
and they knew me, I appeared unto them as El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahuwah or Yahweh or however y'all want to say it, they did not know me. So how could Abraham name a place Jehovah Nisi if he never even knew the name Jehovah or Yahuwah or whatever? So we know that the scribes later basically wrote the name that was being used in their day because the Most High had revealed that name to Israel in Egypt. He never revealed Yahuwah or Yahweh or Yahweh. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they never spoke that name. They never addressed the Most High by that name. So when we read Yahuwah or Yahweh Nisi in Genesis, we know that a scribe later is writing with an understanding, not necessarily writing exactly what Abraham called the place. When we go into this man of sin, this I believe that this is an inundation of those who believe that the Holy See and the Pope or whatever, you, you're going to eat them, so you disagreeing with all of us. But I'm bringing this out. The man, this is the only time in the New Testament that this phrase, man of sin, is written that one time. But when you go to Second Timothy, it is written one time, only one time in the entire New Testament do you find this phrase, man of God. So one time in Paul's letter to Timothy, he writes man of God, and then one time in his letter to the Thessalonians, he writes man of sin. The man of God who is thoroughly furnished unto all good works, is that an individual or is that a whole bunch of people? Now, that's trash, what you said. <laughs> that's no, no, trash. No, 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 <laughs> yeah, no. That's, that's if, trash. And if you want, uh, let me ask you a question. Hold on. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. No, if you want work, let me ask you a question. If you want work. Let me ask you a question right quick. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. When it said, what's the falling away? Give me a precept. What was the falling away? Give me the precept. The falling away were all of those who walked away from Christ. As a matter of fact, no, the I said, give me a precept. <laughs> what is the listen, precept? Tell me what it says. Listen, listen. You want a precept? You want a precept? Yes. It is impossible to renew those who once knew the Lord. It is impossible to renew oh them again God. unto salvation. They have fallen away. Let me show you what I mean. Here, here, this is the falling away. Okay? This man does not know the Bible. This is Luke twenty one twenty four. Well, it says the well, exact same thing. Don't play yourself on this one. No, you playing yourself. Here it is. This Luke twenty one twenty four. This is the falling away. Not even. And they thing. shall fall by the edge of the sword. The falling away. Israel falling away from who they are. That's the falling away he was talking about. This guy does not know the Bible. I keep telling you all that. Uh, uh, that was trash. What you said. Look, look. If you want to debate me on that, hit Sal up, and we could get together another time because. You will get ragdolled all over this lion's den, homie. What is you talking about? Talking about this man don't know the Bible. You done called many times clapping, saying, Zadok, you did that thing there. Don't come today when we disagree talking about this man don't know the Bible. You tripping. Oh. All right, now. <laughs> all right, all right. Maybe you got some more callers standing by. We got some more people standing by. Anybody else want to say anything, though, before we put the next call? I do. I, I, I want to say something. That I, I want to speak on what 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 uh, Zadok brought out about the name of uh, the Most High. Now, when you when you read um, where he talks about, but by my name, uh, Yahweh, did they not know me? There is a question there at the end of that. That is a question. He's he's asking it in a question form. It is not a statement of fact, because throughout the Bible. Abraham is called the friend of God. And you ask yourself a question. Who don't know their friend's name or, or vice versa? If God is calling this man his friend, he's my friend, okay? Take a look at it. Why, why would God not tell his friend his name if he's going that far as calling this man a friend and this man is living his whole life and don't know his friend's name? It doesn't make any sense. And again, what he's reading there in Exodus, that is a question there at the end of it. You can go Google it up, and they will tell you that there was originally a question there in the Hebrew. It was not a statement of fact. Abraham knew the Most High's name. That's why he named that place that. That was not a scribe adding it. If, if he's saying a scribe adding it, he's going to have to show where it wasn't there in the beginning and then show later on where it was added. Otherwise, he's just speculating. 
Okay, let me let me get that. Uh, when it comes to what you just said, Abraham knew him by mighty God or mighty El, which some people may call it El Shaddai. In Exodus, he said to the Most High said to Moses that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not know me by either in the King James, and they say Jehovah, some say Yahweh or Yahweh or whatever you prefer to call him. He is literally telling him a pronunciation, whether wherever you prefer it to be. When, he, when Abraham and Isaac and Jacob knew him as El Shaddai, that was telling us who he was. That's, that's the one thing about the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is based on verbs and adjectives. So I would suggest that you go back and do some more research when it comes to the Hebrew language and, what, and how and the understanding that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what they had when they understood their God to be and who he was. And I yield. Okay. Let me respond to that because I know you don't know Hebrew, okay? First of all, I know you don't know, you don't know Lashawan Kodash, you don't know Hebrew. Because how can Abraham name a Lashawan place Kodash is that not have, Hebrew. that's mumbo jumbo. Brother, you can't prove that. Prove it. Okay, I know you can't prove it. Now, but going back to what Abraham naming that place, uh, Yahweh Jireh, okay? Can none of cannot none of you prove that that is not what Abraham named it? Moses is writing down and said, this is what Abraham named that place. I've not heard any one of you said that when Abraham wrote it and said, this was what Abraham named it, that he didn't name it that. You making speculation about a scribe added it. Where is the proof that a scribe added that there? Where is it? All right, you want to respond to that? I heard somebody wanted to respond. Yeah, you respond to that? Yeah, I'll definitely respond to that. The whole situation is, now, li- li- listen to what the homie said. He said you can Google it and you'll find someone saying that this was a question being posed. I guarantee you I can Google and the opposite argument. So we're not Google scholars here. This is clear that the Most High is telling you, he said, but by my name, Yahuwah, was I not known to them. He told you they knew me as this, but by this name, I was not known. Even the nation itself, even Moses didn't know his name. Moses said, who, when they asked me, who is this Elohim and what is his name? The first thing he revealed is Ayer Asher Ayer. So why is it that Moses didn't say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go tell him that? Yahuwah. You know, Yahuwah, Abraham, you know. The whole. Bro, at the end of the day, the, the scribes wrote. As a matter of fact, let me give you something right quick. Let me give you something right quick. Just, just so you can see what I'm talking about, and maybe later on, even though I didn't want to go here, you kind of picked up and I, you kind of picked up on what I was Smacking a wire around in here with and, and instead of letting us go to the next person So let's just go back to Genesis one time Right quick Let's go to Jacob in his uh, The infamous Jacob Ladder's dream right quick Just let me uh, pull up the text right quick The uh, book of Genesis I didn't, really, I, didn't, I didn't even expect to have to do this But you know you, you, you want proof And you deserve it You deserve it So let me go to Jacob right quick uh, I think it's Genesis 29. Hold on for a second. Nope, I think it's Genesis 28. Genesis 28. Uh, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Uh, hold on. I'm sorry. Nope, that's not Genesis 28 that I want. Hold on, just let me, uh, just let me look over here right quick. <laughs> Um. Okay, check this out. This is this is uh, Genesis twenty-two. It says, um, "And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord shall it be seen." Right. Then, if you back up, let's go. Un, let's back up to. Um, let's back up to uh, 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 Genesis chapter nineteen. If we go to Genesis nineteen, 
when it talks about Moab and Ammon being born, in verse 38 it says, And the younger she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Now, what day is that? That's the day that the scribe is actually writing. It's not actually Moses, but it's actually the scribe writing. We don't even have proof that Moses wrote Genesis, first of all. We don't even have proof that Moses wrote Exodus. All we got is proof that Moses wrote down the statutes, the commandments, and the, and the judgments of Torah. So at the end of the day, bro, if you go and look, you'll see that many theologians believe that the scribes who were writing the complete works were letting you know today in our day that we're writing this place is called this. This place is called this even until this day. And so if you don't look at that, then you might just believe that what you're reading is a whole bunch of stuff that Moses wrote down, and that's just simply not the case. Okay, once again, as you can see, he offered absolutely no proof, but he said that these theologians the, will, will, will give you their conjecture and speculation on something without any facts. If the, the scribe, whether it's in Moses' day or is in after Moses' day, what he wrote is what, either you believe what he wrote or not. If you don't believe what he wrote when he said and uh, called it Jehovah Jireh, it's either you believe what that scribe wrote, whatever time he lived in. If you believe what he wrote, then that's proof to you that he knew the Most High name. If you don't believe what the scribe wrote, then you don't believe the whole five books of the Bible then. Because you're saying that someone other than Moses wrote it, so it's either you believe him or you don't believe him because he made a statement emphatically and says that Abraham called it that. Proof that he knew the name. Okay, if that's the case, if that's the case, my brother, I feel you 100%. I can't overly argue with you all day. So you believe that Moses wrote his own death and wrote about Joshua going into the land of Canaan at the end of Deuteronomy. You believe Moses wrote that? And if you don't believe Moses wrote it, Tell us who wrote it. Okay, brother. If we're going to be here all day going back and forth. I think we're just going to the next caller. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, no no answer. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Listen, like I'm, wait a minute. Wait a minute, brother. Listen, I'm not, I'm not, brother, I'm not running from you because me and you can go all night long. Like I said, you are not. No, no, you can you want to, Let me finish. Can I? 60 seconds. Uh, answer the question. Did Moses write his own death and write Joshua going into the land of Canaan? Yes or no? I don't know, fellas. Let's calm it down. Look it down there. <laughs> it's Shabbat. It's Shabbat. You know what I'm saying? But uh, let's get to the next person. We got to go to the next person now. Let's go to, let's go to 323373. Three, 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 and that would answer your question on this uh, topic where Christ says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, um, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. So if you believe in reincarnation, we were there when he, when, when he was there. Anybody want to address that? Whoa, whoa, yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, can I say something? Can I say something real quick, Sal? Go ahead. Go ahead, sis. Go ahead. Yeah, Shanti. Yeah, Shanti. Go ahead. I, I would love for us to stay on topic, and the topic is the perspective of Second Thessalonians chapter two. Is the man of sin a literal male or a literal man? And if it's a literal male or a literal man, is it the Pope? Let's. I mean, let's stay on topic. This is what I want to say real quick. Sis, who just said that, to all these things be fulfilled, yes, all, all the things are going to be fulfilled and they have not. But the topic is the man of sin. I want to address uh, Awar and the woman who came on before her. Awar, you can read Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. You can read Psalms chapter 119, verse 21. You can read Second Peter chapter 2, verse 21. It will tell you what the falling away is. Falling away is doing what's opposite of what the Most High tells you to do or what the Most High tells you not to do. If the devil is a literal male, M-A-L-E, with a male reproductive organ, right, 
where was that literal male or man in the garden when it was talking to Adam and Eve? And also, where is the literal male or man, if it's the devil, when it was talking to Jesus or Yeshua in Matthew chapter 4? I yield the mic. Okay. Uh, hey, hey, blessings there. Are, are we still there? The sister says she yielded. I don't. I didn't hear yeah, anybody I'm, respond. I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Okay. I'm still here. I oh, okay. I'm like, I'm like, okay. What in the world? But he, he did. A, a sis. He. Um, um. First of all, thank you for uh trying to remind us to get like back on point because we definitely have taken. We done ran off course into the woods and everything. Um. But I answered him and said in Hebrews chapter six, the Bible says. Um, um, verse 4 Hebrews 6 and 4 It is impossible for those who were once enlightened And have tasted of the heavenly gift And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost And have tasted of the good word of God And the powers of the world to come If they shall fall away To renew them Again And I brought up the fact that The man of sin is only mentioned One time in the entire New Testament That phrase The man of sin being revealed and also the phrase the man of god is mentioned one time in the entire new testament you will not find man of god or man of sin in any conjunction besides paul's two letters so i am strictly i am simply under the impression that the man of sin to be revealed in the church is opposite of the man of god the man of god shall be thoroughly furnished unto good works and the man of sin shall rise up in the church and basically um, show himself that he is God Because at the end of the day All of those who actually do not serve Christ As the apostle said in another place They serve their own belly Their own belly is their God And if their own belly is their God Then who is God to them? Themselves Men are God unto themselves They hate God and they worship themselves And it's that simple Well at least it seems to be that simple no, I, I agree with you a hundred percent, Zeta. <laughs> I agree with you hundred percent. And, and um, and I, and, uh, I think I think I think people are getting mixed up on God. You know, God is a spirit. It's, it's breath or wind. You know, it's a spirit. It has different elements. Now, uh, masculine and feminine, like I was saying. But you know, the man of sin. And, and this is what I was saying about the Greek language. The Greek language. It has to be looked at from a first century AD perspective. We have to go back and get these proper definitions for these words because, you know, um, the word for, you know, one specific, there's one specific Greek word for, for one specific thing when it talks about it. So when you see the word man, it does not always mean the same word. So we have to go back into that. But uh, to add to what you're saying real quick, Zadok, male or man, if, if Paul wanted to use male or man specifically, as as we know it, to with a man, with a male reproductive part, he would have used either uh, he would have used uh, uh, G four thirty five, or he would have used um, G four four two, or 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 no or or G seven three zero, G G G seven three zero or G what is it, G four thirty five. And if you go back to the original Greek, I would like to ask anybody in Second Thessalonians where we're going, do you actually see the Greek words G four three five and do you see the word G seven three zero? I yield. I'm done. I think I think the big talk for you kick people off or something. Well, I'm 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 still here. I'm in, I'm 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 still here. Oh, okay. Um, How you doing, yeah. my, uh... I'm doing good. My 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 thing is this from the beginning as far as 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 far as where we at here in, in our second Thessalonians is that I, I went through it and when I read verse four and I'm reading, it says who and then it goes on to say himself and it talks in about he and then he's talking about himself and as as you continue to read all the way down, it is consistently using the pronoun of a male. So the the well, Greek pronoun, word that you got pronoun no, it isn't. Pronoun no, it isn't. Let me finish. Let me finish. Can be a male or a female. Let me finish. Yeah. Sister, when you were talking, no one interrupted you. I know I didn't. I I apologize for that, my brother. I yield. Okay. So now, 
if 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 there if, if there's a Greek word there that can be either male or female, the 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 translators of of the Bible from Greek into English, when they saw that word there, they took a stand. They didn't say they didn't take a stand and said this word can be. They didn't put he or she there. You have some Bibles that have actually he or she in it, but the the uh, the King James translators took a stand and they says we're going to go with man, we're going to go with son, we're going to go with him, we're going to go with he and himself. They took a stand and went that way. So now you guys are coming back and saying this word can be either which way, but you're not saying which way it can be. You're saying it, it's, it's either this or that. You know, you, 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 you have no, difficult, no, no definite conclusion of what it actually is. And as you read down, it's consistently that it's, it's using a, uh, a male pronoun in describing a man. So if you're going to say it can mean he or she, then tell us which one it is. If you're going to sit back and say that, bro, then human, mankind, then, then that, that man, the word mankind consists of male and female. When the Most High said, let us make the man in the Hebrew, when the Most High said, let us make the man in our image, he was talking about the male and the female. So the thing is, is that I understand this, that Paul was speaking from a Torah perspective, not man of sin. It is open. It's not just a male. And, and like I told you, I made my mistake, but you have to show that the, the apostle, when he wrote this, that he was talking about a literal male. And you can't prove it because the word, the, the Greek word that he used is open. It's open to anyone. And anyone can be my, you, whoever it could be a male or a female, so it's not definite. It's not. It's not a definite one person. It's not open to one person. It's not based may on I the say context real quick, of the BA? word. May, may I say something real yeah. quick, BA? Real, yeah, real quick, real quick. Uh, the, the, this is this is the issue with the Greek language, according to Greek classical Greek. Greek is very specific. Okay, Greek is very specific. There are three words that mean head in Greek. One is kephale, one is arche, and one is exousia. Okay, um, the thing about Greek is it's, it's being very specific in every passage in this New Testament. So in Second Thessalonians chapter two, the text is being specific. The thing is, it's being specific. It specifically means to say humankind, male or female. The Greek is very specific. I think we don't have an understanding of the proper definition of, of how the Greek language works. Hey, if I, could, if I could kind of play the advocate here for what the brother is saying, I think that the part he's getting at is, okay, if you're saying it could go either way, if you have these following words, um, exalted himself of himself that he is God. So I think his point is, okay, if it is the word, the Greek word for man, and it could be male or female, then whoever are the translators from Greek to English, they're definitely using he and himself in the context of man of sin, who exalted himself and show himself that he is God. Is that the point that you're making, Brother Amiyah? Yes, brother. Thank you. Okay, so in that context, I think that this is where the, this is where his argument is. It's like, okay, if it's any, if it could be anyone, I think that anyone is a he. And in that context, I wouldn't argue with him. My thing is, is the he an individual, or is the he just referring to, as y'all said earlier, the like like the people, like anyone who comes into that context is going to be under that he, even if it's a woman. And why do I say that? The Bible says, excuse me, the Bible says, um, 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 the man that sinned shall be put to death. If, if, a son sin, if, if a son sin to sin, his father won't be punished, or if the father sin, the soul that sin, if it shall die, the Lord says, that man shall die. But in the context, but all, if you notice, all the commandments are spoken Primarily in the in the male construct, in the masculine construct, because it is exactly. execution. It is execution of um of, of authority, but every one of those commandments include the female. Every single exactly. one. So, so 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 in that construct, when we go to Second Timothy, and it says the scripture is given for instruction, reproof, um, uh, and correction. 
so that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That man of God includes the female. Exactly. Now, and I so, in the same, so, oh, okay. so, so in the same context, so because the, because in, because in Paul's letter to Timothy, he says so that he he will this and he and the man, but it never addresses the female because the word is encompassing the species or the community or the 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 the, the, the man in the context of the, the the being and not necessarily the male or the female, even if it's a he. So like for instance, the nation of Israel is called a son. And then when it's problems, the Lord in Hosea and in Ezekiel call the nation a woman and say she played poor. So the context is necessarily relationship. And I think the point that my brother and sister is making, which I agree with, is when you get to the man of sin being revealed, it's more or less, it, it is right, it is, uh, it is anthropos, but it's talking about, it's still referring to the individual or the person of sin. Just like it says, just like we read in Hebrews, um, that, um, that those who actually have tasted of the good and fall away, and fall away from Christ, it's impossible to renew them. I think that the language actually leaning towards the man of sin being the opposite of the man of God. And if we can't say the man of God is specifically male or one individual, then we have to at least leave room for the man of sin not being that specific, even if we get the he's and this, that, and the third. And I would say... Yeah, I want to apologize to y'all. I'm getting kicked off my own show tonight. <laughs> it's really crazy, man. Kicked off my own show tonight, brother. But um, guys, yeah, you can say something. Like that. Yeah. All, all I just want to say is like when the Messiah said, "Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word." Was he talking about males, or was he talking about the human race, or just specifically he was talking about man, which consists of male and female? That's all I'm saying here. I mean, for us to come out and say, and I'm not saying no one here, I'm just speaking in general, for anyone to come out and say that this man is saying it's the Pope or a Muslim, no, that's not, that's, no, it's deeper than that. And that's all I'm saying. Uh, and that's, that's the point I want to bring up, that it's a Pope, and then you got people, you're telling people they're going to sit in a temple and a literal building structure where we understand according to the doctrine of the apostles when they used the word naos, they were talking about the metaphorical temple, the body. The, our bodies are a temple. And then all of a sudden we're telling people or it's being taught that this man is sitting go sit three and a half years in this literal building structure supposedly, and after that three and a half years, the Messiah is going to show up. And I'm like, hold on, Christ never said, Christ said that, when I come make my second coming, I'm going to come as a thief in the night. No man knows. But if you got people believing after this three and a half years that the Messiah is going to come, then we know exactly when he's going to come when this so-called male or this Pope or this Muslim takes the temple. We know. So do we say that the Messiah made a mistake? And I know we ain't going to fix our lips to even say that. I know for a fact no one on here would say the Messiah made a mistake. I know for a fact. The Messiah, the Messiah should be the final authority. Whatever he says, it should go. Even, and if I'm going to go and find out about his second coming, I'd rather hear from him himself. He said, I'm going to creep up on you like a thief in the night. That means it can happen at any moment. I'm not arguing the signs of, the, of the festivals. I'm just bringing that up. What I'm saying is that if someone said I'm going to come as a thief in the night, that means it can happen at any moment. Hey, B.A. That's, oh, that's my point. Oh. Yeah. B.A., the, the, the word yeah, for temple, the, the word for temple there that you were talking about in Second Thessalonians, because it's a, he sitteth in the temple of God showing himself he is God. That word is yeah. nails. Now, if you look at the other times that the, put it like this, in all of Paul's letters, that's the word. And in every letter of Paul, except this one, this will be the only time where he will be referring to the literal temple in Jerusalem and not the church. So when he said, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, it's the word nails. 
he said, when he said, what fellowship do the temple of God have with idols, talking about what fellowship do the church have with idols, that word is nails, and it's the same word here. Now, when you go to the literal temple, if you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, I guarantee you it's the word heros, and it is not nails. Yep. Because exactly. heros, heros actually carries the idea of the entire temple precincts, the outer court, everything, the building, everything. But what makes nails special is, is that it's talking about behind the veil, the most holy place. It's called nails. So the Bible, Paul in his letters kept telling the church, you truly are where God dwells. You are the temple that is made without hands. This Antichrist or this man of sin is going to reveal himself, and it says he sitteth in the holiest place. But Paul in all his other letters kept t- saying that this was the people themselves. So does the brother, hey, brother Amiyan, if you did, are you under the imp- Do you understand that if the word nails is being used in Second Thessalonians, that Let's say it is a person, because you didn't say it was the Pope, so I'm not going to put that on you. But whoever it may be, are, are you saying that this person has to sit in a third temple that's supposed to be built in Jerusalem any day now? Or are you just saying that this man is basically going to have control? Of, what, what are you saying? Because that word does not is not talking about the temple temple, but it's talking about the most holy place where God dwells. And all of Paul's letters, except this one, he referred to nails as the church. The, the the people themselves is where God came and dwelt in. And he said, you are the nails of God. You truly are the holy place, which was represented by that place that was behind the curtain in the literal temple. So w- what do you understand, whoever this person is, where are they going to sit? Is there a third temple to be built, or is it something different? Okay. Um, if, if, if we're going to deal with... Uh progression you know what i'm saying things things laid out in 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 process if 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 we're at oh okay this is a man this is this 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 is a human being is a man okay and it talks about um a temple okay so we know that uh, uh physically uh, a human being a man cannot sit up in your temple cannot sit up inside of you okay so if 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 we are at a physical human being then we should be at a physical temple it shouldn't be a physical human being with a symbolic temple of someone's body that a physical man cannot dwell in, that wouldn't make any sense. So, so if if you deal with progression, if he if it's a physical human being, then it would have to be a physical temple. Okay, I, okay, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. Now, of course, uh, of course, I see it differently. But okay, there would have to be a physical temple. Now, do you know that Paul? And none of his letters refers to the physical temple. This would be the only one. Do you know that at least? No, I don't. I don't. I don't, I know it now since you told me. Even though I'm going okay. to look it up anyway, because I always it's always fact check things. So. Okay, if you find different though, please somehow reach out to us and let us know because B A and um, I believe Sister Shanti, y'all have said it a couple times tonight. Well, no, I think B A. He kept bringing up the nail, saying every time Paul uses it. He's referring to the church as the nails of God. Know ye not that ye are the nails of God. And whenever the literal temple in Jerusalem is referred to, it's the other Greek word, heteros, which means the literal building and everything included with it. So um, that also gives us the idea of what the man of sin is or this individual or this person because all through the, all through the text, we're finding the idea, you know, interesting, like in First John, in another part of John, he, he says, he who loves not his brother who he sees daily is a liar, claiming he loved God who he hath not seen. So what about the woman? See, 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 that language, is, is, it, it includes the female in it, even though it never says she, and even though it never says sister. Because if not, then females are exonerated. Because you, know, you even got people running around saying lesbian God isn't isn't against lesbianism because in the because in the Old Testament he says those who lie with a man like he would a woman. So they try to use that to say he didn't address women laying with women. So it's the same construct where 
there are many things that are spoken of where it is it is barely meant to talk about the entirety of the people, but it'll usually say he or brother or the man that does this, the man who hates his brother. But that's talking about the woman too. All right, uh, I got to okay. end the Jeff real quick. We have like 14 minutes on the air. We have 14 yeah, minutes yeah. on the air, family. So I got to get some of y'all questions, and I appreciate the people that's tuning in uh, via phone or via Skype. Let's go to the next person. Let's go to 864-316. You're live in there. Shabbat Shalom. Can everybody hear me? Loud and clear. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, this is David. I'm calling in from South Carolina. Um, I just wanted to share my point of view. I appreciate everyone coming on tonight and sharing their point of view. And my viewpoint is sim- similar to Doris that called in earlier. I believe that the uh, man of sin or man of lawlessness is the anti-Messiah in Genesis 3.15. For me, I believe that the seed of the woman is the, the Messiah. So if the seed of the woman who is the Messiah is going to be at enmity with the seed of the Nakash or the serpent, then that must mean to me that he is the anti-Messiah. Because, for example, when the Messiah is talking to the Israelites in John 8, he clearly refers to the devil and says that the devil has been lying since the beginning. Well, the first person, spirit, being, or whatever that lied in the scriptures is going to be the Nakash or the serpent, and he says that they are the the children of him. So that lets us know that the devil has offspring, whether that's spiritual, physical, literal, metaphorical, whatever, that is the way that I understand that. And it says that in Genesis 3.15, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. All throughout the Tanakh, but I'm not going to go too far into this, we see types and shadows of the Messiah and the anti-Messiah. Nimrod is an anti-Messiah. Pharaoh is an anti-Messiah. Moses is a Messiah. Moses and Pharaoh were in opposition and hostile towards each other, so to speak, because Pharaoh opposed God's anointed one, his Messiah, in that situation who was Moses. And God delivered his people out from the oppression of this type of anti-Messiah. As First John 2.18 lets us know, there is one Messiah and, and many Messiahs. Same for the anti-Messiah. There's one singular anti-Messiah and many little anti-Messiahs all around the world. Basically, anyone who rejects and works in opposition to the Messiah is an anti-Messiah. It's sort of like uh, anti-abortion. If you're anti-abortion, you preach and teach against it. You're not for it. You don't want nothing to do with it. You, you want it done and gone away with. Versus if you are pro-abortion, you want it done. You want to teach it. You want it to be in existence. You're not working against it. You're working for it. But we can understand that pro and anti type of language when we look at modern concepts like that. But I wanted to go back to 2 Thessalonians because I believe that it is talking about a specific man. Now, the the Messiah obviously has been revealed for the first time 2,000 years ago, and he's coming back. And it says in 2 Thessalonians that the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the master Yahushua will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the work of Hasatan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Now, if we go to Revelation 19, when it talks about the Messiah coming back on the white horse, Revelation 19, 19, 19 through 21 says, And all the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. 
that that's what I believe is the anti Messiah is this false prophet with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worship his image. Those both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all of the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now, I'm, I'm not going to read the next chapter, but if you go on, you will see that the there's three entities or beasts or whatever that are being referred to. That's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The false prophet and the second beast are thrown into the lake of fire. Hasatan is not destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire until after the thousand-year reign is up. So for me, I just wanted to just basically sum it up and say, if the seed of the woman is the Messiah, wouldn't it make sense that the seed of the Nakash or the serpent is the anti-Messiah? And I just wanted to share that. So, again, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Yad Hey, 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 Shalom. Hey, what's that brother's name? What's your name? I- David. Hey, David. Oh, brother David. Hey, peace, bro. Hey, I want to ask you to do something for me right quick. Because what you're mm-hmm. saying, I think everyone on here is familiar with. Um, I, yeah, that stance that you hold, I, 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 was, I was there probably in, like, 98. So I'm feeling you 100% or your explanation and reasoning. I, 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 want, I, I want you to read something with me right quick, if you would be willing to. Okay. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Okay, hang on one second. Okay, what verse? Is it number one or? No, um, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, actually. And it, uh, and it reads, uh, Be ye not unequal together with unbelievers. Right. Um, for what yeah. fellowship? What fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion have light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And then it goes into once again, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple mm-hmm. of the living God. Here, the temple of the living God is the people. And I was saying to the brother earlier, he hadn't confirmed it yet because he'll probably go and, you know, look it up himself to confirm it or not. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if he's familiar. In all of Paul's letters where he refers to the temple, the only one where he will be talking about the temple in a literal sense would be, in, at least in my opinion, would be what we're, what the, the crux of this discussion in Second Thessalonians. Here – the temple of God, both times, the nails, not the hydros, but the temple of God, the most holy place of God is the people. And Paul constantly writes this in his letters, right? Here, Christ and Belial are the opposites of one another. Do you know who Belial is? I can't, rec- I can't tell you everything about him, but I, I understand the gist of kind of what Belial is all about. Like they would okay. refer to people back in the Tanakh as sons of Belial. Right. Now, when you actually look at it, the first time that the sons of Belial or Belial, I like the way you say it, is mentioned is um, is in Deuteronomy 13 when it talks about some sons of children of Belial had left from the children of Israel and they had said, let us go and serve other gods. And then you get into, you know, whether it's Job, Samuel, all of that, you got mm-hmm. – you got the men of Belial, and then you got sons of Belial, and then you have men of Belial. And when you look up Belial, it's basically just the Hebrew word Belial, and it actually carries the idea of, and it's interesting because it doesn't change in the Greek at all um, in, 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 uh, in transliteration. <clears throat> Pardon me. The word actually is number, um, it's number uh, 1097 in the Hebrew, and 3276, so it's really two words together, and it basically means um, the evil, the wicked, the naughty, the ungodly, or the worthless, or those who are without profit. So the sons of Belial, or Belial itself, is not an actual individual. Mm -hmm. It is just wickedness itself. So when we look at 2 Corinthians, Notice how wickedness itself is said to be the opposite of Christ. And if you want to go with how they like to do it in English, they want to put Christ in capital letters, and then they put Belial. And I mean, 
they spell Christ with a capital, letting using it as a noun for an individual, right? Mm-hmm. Then they and, and we know that English grammar now has to come into play. What we've learned since school now, Belial is the opposite. What Concord have Christ with Belial? Belial is spelled with a capital as a name. You be not used as a pronoun, but as a noun, like an individual. But we, but Belial nowhere in the scripture is a individual. It's just wicked. It's the spirit of wickedness itself. But notice how it's personified as a noun, like it's an individual. And I believe that in the same right. construct, the man of sin or the the, the 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 lawless one, I believe that it's Belial. I understand what you're saying. is going to stand up in the church. Because I, I don't. But I could be I wrong. Don't, I could be wrong. Our brother David, to be fair, but I just wanted I to show you. I don't know much about. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I was just saying. I'm. Just, I wanted you to see my my line of reasoning. I, I'm. I'm. A, I'm not above reproach. I could be wrong, but I just wanted to show you how Belial in Second Corinthians in the New Testament is a noun, as if it's an individual. But Belial is not a person. And 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 you can um reach me. You you'll find my information um. In the description of this, you can reach out to me and say, Jose, I researched Belial, and this is what I found or didn't find. But if you do the research, I'm pretty sure you'll come to the conclusion I have. Belial is not a person, but it is spoken of as a noun, as if it is a person. I see what you're saying. For me, I don't know much. I, 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 will, say this. I will say I have not research fully, especially in terms of like the word temple, when y'all were saying that there's different times that it's or different ways that temple is used in the Greek. I have read that before. I don't know much about that, so I can't really offer any insight or my own opinion or understanding about when it says that the man of lawlessness will sit in the temple of God and proclaim to be God and to receive worship. But for me, yeah. I just I, I do see what you're saying, though. I, I, I do agree on the personification of things, but I think that earthly that Yah t- uses earthly things for us to understand spiritual things and heavenly yes, things so not not yes. to say that we can bring them down to our level but so we can at least have a, a common understanding or approach to how we're even understanding these things so for me no. that's why when i read about Gen- genesis three fifteen, when it prophecies the seed of the woman and if and just for me if i take that literally as being the messiah and then the seed of the serpent is going to be the anti-Messiah. So I would just have to take that, however that might come about, as being a literal man, however he might come into fruition, whether that's been personified throughout the Tanakh, and then it's going to be revealed through an individual person. But I, I can't say either way. But I do believe, though, that this is based on Genesis 3.15, because I, I'm, I don't believe any longer in my life that Paul just started making stuff up and pulling stuff out the blue. You know, I believe yeah. he was a very well-educated Torah scholar to where he would know, know what he's talking about. So when I read things like this, even if I don't understand the exact revelation that he's bringing, I can at least look into the Torah or in the prophet and see, okay, well, I at least see groundwork for this. So I can at least start here. You know, uh, hold, on, my way on. hold on, Brother Davis, so I'll interrupt you. We only have like one minute on the air, family. You have one minute on the air. You're going into the overtime portion of the show. So you're going to have to dial that number, 319-527-6239. Air the rest of the show live. That. Well, um, I guess I'll just uh, – do you have anybody waiting on the line? Because if so, um, I'll yield and yeah, talk to yeah, you once again. But... Yeah, I have some other Okay, then, well, hey, 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 Brother I Sam. think I've hey, shared hey, enough. Thank you. thank you for letting me talk. Hey brother, hey brother David, thank you. Hey Sal, if 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 B A and and and, and, uh, and Shanti are still there, um, if if one of them right quick um could confirm whether or not they believe I was correct in explaining Christ and Belial in Second Corinthians because they are the opposites of one another. But they still on that. Sure. Everybody's still on. That's. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I confirm. Uh, go ahead, B.A. Uh, no, after B.A. After, after says something, I, I do want to respond to David real quick with two, with, with two questions. Go ahead. 
Yeah, no, no I, I stand with you on that. You know what I'm saying? I, I can see, even though I'm not as, uh, I, I've touched on it before, but what you, what you explained based on the definition of the words, I'm sitting up here looking at it myself. Uh, I can see, I can see where you, I can see your point, but I can always get back at you, brother, brother, and let you know. You know what I'm saying? But I, okay. I understand your point, though. Yeah. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, hold on. We need a, you need to get Amayan in there, man. You can't exclude Amayan. <laughs> you got to say Amayan. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sal. Uh, as far as um, Belial is concerned, um, we have in the Old Testament where certain men are called uh, sons, sons of Belial. They're actually spoken of there in, in the Old Testament. So um, it, it kind of points you um, some kind of being, whether physical or spiritual, because men are being phrased as the sons of Belial. And I think even in, 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 in Christ's time, they even call Christ, I think they call him Belial, I think uh, a couple of times in the, uh, in, in the Gospels. You know what I'm saying? So uh, different places, when you when you look at it, it, it could be referring to Satan, because Satan um, is is referenced as Belial in, in different places in the Scripture. So it, it, it would depend on the context Paul is trying to bring out here in Second Corinthians. But you, you see Christ and Satan is definitely the opposite. So when you read it, mm-hmm. I guess from face value, you would you would you would concur that it, it's my it's probably talking about Satan. Okay. Right. Okay. I feel I feel where you're coming from. All right, uh, Shanti, you want to ask uh, Brother David two questions? You can do that. Yeah, he doesn't have to answer right now, but this is for everybody. Um, and 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 before I ask the questions, I want to say this. Uh, I don't I don't mind anyone's stance. You know, we have a stance. Other people have a stance. Um, I, I wasn't always at the stance. It took some time. Um, you know, in, in prayer, meditation conversation with, with, with the Father, uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me into all truth. But this is the thing. If there is a literal man, right, that's got to sit in a literal temple, are, are, are people realizing that if a literal man has to sit in a literal temple, who's going to build this literal temple? Are the Israeli people going to build this literal temple? And if so, are they going to build this temple over in 1948 Israel? That's one question. And then another thing talking about the seed of the woman, well, God or Elohim is a breath of wind spirit. Um, the, the seed of, of the woman, that, that seed definitely had to come from, from a giver. And that, that seed from that giver was not from a literal male. There was no sperm. You know, that spirit, that spirit gave the woman the seed. And, yeah. and this is the thing. And this is the thing. Jezebel. Isn't Jezebel an anti Messiah? Yeah. That was a woman. We we keep talking about these males, you know, but, but also females also had this 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 spirit of anti Messiah. Anything anti Messiah or anti an, an, anti God is anybody who goes into opposition of the word and the word is the Torah. The Torah is thou shalt do or thou shalt not do. You know what I mean? It's 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 a governing for our life, but offspring. If you're saying Hashatan has offspring, are you saying Satan has offspring? Are you saying Satan is asexual? You know, are are you saying that Satan can only make offspring by himself? You saying there's no there's no womb? You know what I mean? And and when you say prophet, are there only male prophets or are there female prophets as well? And and let's go to Revelation 17. You got this woman, you got this woman sitting on this beast, right? This woman was the mother of harlots. That spirit was on that woman to, to, to woo people from following the Most High Yahweh and, and his son. So any, that, that's the answer inside of there. So those, those are my questions, you know. And, and lastly, I think, like I said, people, if, if, if you would go back to read the original Greek definitions of words, this man, when you see the word M-A-N in English, is it literal man with a male reproductive organ? Is it G-435? Or is it G seven three zero? I yield. All right, we're in the overtime portion of the show, family. Now I don't want us to get cut off, man. You know, overtime sometimes is funny. I got cut off like three times already on my own show. So let's get to the next caller and after that many pretty much get some final work from everybody. I don't want nobody to get cut off. Let's get to the next call. Let's go to six seven eight five seven seven. You'll have an air. Can you hear me? Six seven eight five seven seven. Are you there? Uh, 
Can y'all hear me? Am I loud and clear? Can I be heard? I, I can hear you. All yeah, right, one more time. Sorry. Six seven eight five seven seven. Are you there? All right, sound like he uh in the kitchen or something like that. All right. <laughs> All right, anything else y'all want to bring up or, you know, or discuss before we, uh, you know, wrap it up pretty much? Y'all could, y'all could do that now. I would just like to say, despite whatever, despite all the information that came out today, I would like, I appreciate everybody for bringing out their opinions and what they understand, what the Most High has revealed in this text. And one thing I would like to say, I think we can all walk away and from here and be like, and think or come to the conclusion that, okay, this man is sin. I'm pretty sure the people who are listening, I'm hoping and praying that that they have an open mind and to and see that it's not a literal individual for from what I just shared. You know what I'm saying? Um based on the Greek words. Um, even if you go the other way around, it's like I said, based on what Paul was saying, we still have him the the words he's using it's open to either male or female or anyone. So that's, all, that's the only thing I'm saying. So before we definitely say, oh, it's going to be a male person and it could be a pope or whoever it may be, I think we need to be, we just need to just sit back and actually come to an understanding that this man of sin, it, women, women are, do just as much damage as men do, and it's open to anyone. That's how I see it. And I'm not saying that I'm right or I'm wrong, but or I'm wrong, right or wrong. I'm not saying I'm right and I'm always right. But what I'm saying is, when I read the text, that's what I see, and um, I'm open to discuss this and take this even further, maybe another dialogue or whatever. Um, but I think another thing we we have to also understand temple, the temple. Um, we we still haven't come to a conclusion on the temple. Some people believe it's a literal builder structure. Some believe that it's the actual metaphysical temple, which I understand because we know historically that the apostles, when they mentioned the temple, they were talking about the body, the metaphorical temple. They they didn't, Paul did not give us any indication that he was talking about a literal building structure. All right, before, uh, before I go, uh, we get some last from everybody else, somebody else press number one real quick. Let's see what they got to say. Let's go to 443619. You're live in air. Hey, what's up, Sal and our brothers and sisters on there? You guys talked a lot about this. I just wanted to share this, that, you know, when you go to Genesis chapter 3, um, I think it's verse 15, he puts Satan's seed before the Messiah's actual existence. So I think people, if they want to find out who that man of sin is, they need to first find out who came before the Messiah, okay, and uh, represent it as a representative for Satan. And they will lead them to the proper location of who he is. Because he's not just defined by this man of sin. I think a lot of people are mis- are confusing that. That's just one location for the Greek, but you also have to go into the Old Testament, which they also were drawing from, and he's described oftentimes in many different ways, as a king, prince, all kinds of different things. Okay, beast, <laughs> you pick what you want. But the bottom line is he's not just confined to what you were trying to uh, look at him as um, in the book of Thessalonians under the Greek. You have to, you have to use scriptures and combine together. You know what I mean? Instead of just trying to use one section or one part of it alone and make your doctrine, you have to combine them. But anyway, I just want to share that with you guys. Great show. You know, you guys are getting in and showing your different uh, perspectives. Appreciate it. Shalom. Uh, you, anybody going to address them? You going to address it? Anybody? Got it. If I yeah. can, uh, can I say Sal? something? Sorry, I, I yield. Okay, I I just want to say I I like I like what the brother said just now because it it goes back to um Isaiah 28 where it talks about that the word of God was unto them um precept upon precept precept must be upon precept line upon line here a little now the the, the brother the brother that has the stance that um uh, this is not a literal man he goes into the Greek definitions and different things like that but he doesn't go precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, to bring it out through scriptures. He's just going into Greek words, and that's where he actually stays at, and he doesn't have scriptures to back up that this is not a literal man. I think you you would have to have scriptures as well, other than just Greek definitions, to help establish your point. Because... Um, when you, when you speak of Greek terms and, and things like that, you know, you go off, you go off into etymology. Etymology gives you a whole plethora 
of definitions and, and something figurative and could be this and could be that. So it, it, it has you all over the place. And it, it leaves you for you to have to come up with what, exactly what it is saying, and, and it, it's so wide open, you can come to the wrong conclusion. But if you have scriptures, line up online here, a little there, a little to help support what you have to bring it together, it can help you to find exactly what Paul is talking about. I know Shanti wants to say something, guys, Shanti. Uh, sure. Uh, first, I'd like to say, as, as if, if anybody listening is New Testament believers, um, if we're going to have a problem with the original language that the New Testament is written in, we're going to have a problem believing in Yeshua or Jesus as Messiah. I want to say that. Um, the, the brother said you've got to combine the Old Testament with the New Testament. I definitely agree. Um, my brother B.A. says it well. The Old Testament is the Messiah hidden. New Testament is, is Messiah revealed. This is what I want to say about the Messiah. No one came before the Messiah. That's my sense. Um, Colossians chapter 1 says, uh, uh, because in him we were created uh, all, all that are in the heaven. So Messiah was, was, was pre-existing. Messiah took part in creation. So Messiah took part in creation. That means the, the spirit of Satan did not come before the Messiah. That's, that's my stance. Um, so that's, that's the thing. We, we do got to combine them, but we got to know how to combine them. And, and, and lastly, I'll say this. Um, my stance um, I, I wasn't always on this stance. It took some time, like I said, but I really believe that Second Thessalonians chapter two is more spiritual um, and, and, and discussing things that were the end time. Paul definitely knew what he was talking about. Um, and and the Second Thessalonians, as far as I can see, uh, the 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 time when the Messiah will return that's more spiritual. That's what Revelation is revealing. That there's spiritual, metaphoric, symbolic meaning meanings in there. So the 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 times when the man of sin in the Old Testament was probably a, a, a literal person. Well, that literal person came to teach us what was going to happen in the end times spiritually. So I, I yield after that. All right. Uh, let's get some last words in, y'all. Uh, Brother VA, last words. Um, I'll just say this much, and I'll give you in a second. Um, like I said, um, the information has been brought out for those who are listening. Just look up the information for yourself, and you'll be the one. This thing about looking, staying the Greek and not trying to connect it with the scriptures. And Look, we dealing, when Paul wrote this letter, and if we're going to sit here and have an issue with the Greek language, then why believe in the New Testament? That's what I have to say. If, that, if that's the case, then why is it that we, why is it that we believe in the New Testament? if all of a sudden now that it's a problem to, to go back and research the language when it comes to a doctrine that's being ta- taught that the, the man of sin could be either a Muslim or a Pope. And I'm not saying the brother on here is saying that. I'm just speaking from a general perspective. That's all I'm saying. If, if we're having a problem with the fact that, that we did, that we're looking at the Greek language and we're, and we're looking at it and saying and we see that Paul was not specifically talking about a literal male, that when he said man of sin, he he was talking about the human the human being. Rather, it could be anyone. That that that's what I'm trying to say here. I'm not trying to sit here and tell nobody they're dead wrong or they're off. I'm just saying that this man of sin teaching. I think that we need to look at it from a deeper perspective based on how Paul wrote it. When he was writing this, the man had an understanding. He knew what he was talking about. So, are you going to say that Paul had no idea what he was talking about? Because based on the fact that it wasn't revealed the way how he wrote it in the Old Testament, and that's my and that's how I, that's what I get from the brother who just said about go find go line upon line piece of my precept. And I may be wrong, but correct, and I yield. And I'm done. And before I let you do that, uh, I just want to let people know I try to um, embed that video, brother VA, into the description box. But uh, apparently, you know, it's a Facebook video, so there's no way I can really do that. So. Only thing I can re- recommend people to do is go to his Facebook. I have it in the description box. Or, you know, it's going to be on the YouTube page, Vlog Talk. You know, the video is right there his, uh, on his Facebook page. Uh, any more information you want to share with the people about that particular video so we can go see it? No, nah, just uh, if anyone wants to reach me, you can reach me at uh, B.A. Ben Abraham on Facebook. If you want to email me, my email is 916-Maccabee at gmail.com, 916-Maccabee at gmail.com. Or you can reach me at B.A. Ben Abraham on Facebook. And I yield. 
And I want to thank you once again, man, because, you know, you brought the topic up, so that, that's why we have a show today. So I appreciate you, Brother B.A. Now let's go to Amayan. Last words. That words. All right, thank you, Sal. Before I begin, I'd like to say shalom, peace, and love to all of the special guests, Brother B.A., uh, the, 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 the sister Ashanti, uh, Brother Zadok in Israel, um, Robert Reed, I guess he had to, he had to get off. Um, as far as this topic here is concerned, um, the King James translators, as we understand from the historical record, is that these men were scholars, and these men understood the Greek language. They were not like novices or, or, or guessing or whatnot. These men understood the Greek languages, and they translated from Greek into English, and they took a stand. They translated and said that this is talking about a literal man, he, by what they translated and used. And these men were scholars. Okay, so these I, I, I put more faith in people who actually are scholars of a language that understand a language more than um, after hundreds of years later, we going back into it, and we have not come to a conclusion yet. Yet the scholars who actually translated, they came to a conclusion. They took a stand. We can't be going backwards going back to it, we don't know what it is, we don't know who it is, when the scholars who translated is telling us who it is. Uh, according to Hebrew reckoning, it says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses shall all things be established. There's, there is, if, if, if the Greek can be even phrased as a witness, I can go that far and say, yes, let's, let's say it is, because I have no problem with the Greek at all whatsoever. What I said was, you, if if you have scriptures to back up the Greek of what you're saying, then it it more establishes your point. But if it's only in the Greek, and then people can go in and say, well, it can mean this also too, brother. It can mean it also. Then you, what you have on your hand is a debate. You have nothing. You have nothing that is that is definitive. Uh, as far as this is concerned, if if this is if, if this is not a literal temple. If it is not a literal temple, it's, it's speaking of something that is that is uh, figuratively meaning a person, meaning a, a a a human's body, not a not a building. Then whoever whoever this this man here is, he would have to be a spirit, because only a spirit can dwell in a in in a human body. And if it's a physical human being, then it would have to be a physical temple. So it 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 would it doesn't matter which way you kind of word it, if it's not a physical temple again, it's, it's speaking of human beings, then this man of sin would have to be spirit. You have to be so. So now we, we're talking about Paul is speaking of a spiritual entity here that can actually dwell in human beings' body, or vice versa, or or it's an actually physical human being and it's a physical temple. So once again, we're here. Uh, speculating on which what it is, what could it be? It could be this, it could be that. When the translators have told us what it is, is you, we can't go backwards again and be saying we don't know what it is, and it could be anybody. Come on now, we need to we need to have something definitive because a teacher is supposed to teach the people what it is and not give them something that's wide open where they're left to their own interpretation. That happened to Israel in the past, where people were just telling them certain things and they interpreted it themselves. You know, so we need to. We need if we're going to be if we're going to be a teacher of, uh, of people, we need to go in and interpret it and come with proof with scriptures to what we are saying, and we can't just be saying what we think it is, and it could be that. And with that, once again, I want to thank all uh, the the special guests. Thank the brother Saf for having me back on the show, and to everybody everywhere, shalom. Uh, we appreciate you, Amaya, and uh, let's go to my sister Shanti. Last words. Last words. Uh, I want to say Shabbat Shalom. That means Sabbath peace to the people. Um, that means a, a good a good twenty four hours of uh, rest and uh, peace amongst our brothers and sisters. Uh, <clears throat> I want to apologize again to Brother Amaya. I didn't have my, uh, my phone on mute, but I, I didn't mean to interrupt because that's that's unlike my character. But uh, I want to thank you, Sal. I want to thank you, Amaya. I want to thank you, Brother B.A. I want to thank my brothers I don't. Um, a couple of things I want to say. Um, I do want to uh, give out references real quick, uh, some lexicons that have helped me. Um, I know a lot of people go to the Thayer's uh, Greek lexicon. What I've done is I've done some research on the Thayer's Greek lexicon, it actually gives um, later definitions or changed definitions during the Byzantine Empire. What I mean is like, you know, 
after 600 A.D. all the way up to, you know, uh, 19th, 20th century and later, right? There is a lexicon called the uh, Greek-English lexicon, an intermediate Greek-English lexicon by Liddell and Scott, L-I-D-D-E-L-L and Scott, S-C-O-T-T-S. This lexicon right here gives the classical or Koine Greek original definition uh, um, noted by scholars from 1000 BC, BCE, for Common Era, all the way up to 600 AD. That means that these definitions in here, they, they correspond or they corroborate the definitions for the New Testament. Um, also, uh, you can do some comparative study with a Greek and English lexicon of the New Testament, um, a translation and adaptation of the fourth revised and augmented edition of Walter Bowers. If you go to the strong concordance, you'll see like the the acronym B uh, B D A G. B D A G is referring you back to that lexicon. And then there's also lexicons. The the strong concordance refers you back to Miguel and Scott as well. Um, that's that's what I wanted to give out to the people. Um, and and this is the thing. Lastly, I'll say. Um, we are going to believe what we want to believe, and, and everybody's going to have a stance until the Holy Spirit leads and guides into all truth. Um, we just put out the information. Uh, we're not here to say anybody's right. We're not here to say anybody's wrong. We're just putting out the information and asking you to go back. Once you get an understanding of the little words in their proper original language definition, then you go into deeper layers of that. You go into deeper layers. You you you, you have the natural to understand the spiritual. Um so that that's what I encourage people to do. Um I'm I'm a student as as well, like Brother BA always says. I'm I'm a student first. Um I'm I'm definitely not over anybody. But I, I just would love for people to go back, read, search and study on your own. This is a personal relationship with the most high Yahweh the Most High Lord God of Israel. This is a personal relationship. So I just want to encourage people to remain steadfast in your faith and, and to sustain your personal relationship with the Most High because when you do, things get revealed to you. I have been corrected in this walk many a time, and this thing is about growth and understanding. And, and um, I just want to say Shabbat Shalom to the, to the people out there. Thank you for having me on, Sal, and um, peace, to, peace to the brothers out there. Um, Peace to the brothers out there in, in your walk and your faith. All right, that's just Ashanti. And uh, like I said, everybody's uh, information is in the description box. If you want to reach out to any of the special guests on the panel, go to the description box on YouTube, on iTunes, and of course on the Blog Talk Radio if you want to reach out. I appreciate you. Let's go to Zadok. Last words. Yo, peace and blessings. Um, Yo, it was cool being here. I haven't really dealt with the man of sin discussion in a couple of years because it's so much, uh, you know, to the vast word of God and the different seasons we find ourselves in. But I do know that it is an important topic nonetheless. Um, I appreciate the brother Amiyan. I believe I'm, pardon me, I believe that we all here um, on a panel with him understand where he's coming from. So not to be right or try to be little thing is, is that, that explanation is out there. Uh, that's a common explanation in evangelical Christianity. I want to put a couple things in perspective. If you do research, you will actually understand um, that the idea of the papal order being, um, so for instance, because it was a reason BA kept bringing up like the Pope or Muslim. If you do research, I think we have to be fair to the church uh, the brother Amiyan said something that was very critical. We are 2,000 years removed from the pinning of these things. I think it would do us well if we want to do some research of what were they saying in the second century that the Antichrist, that, that the Antichrist was? Why is it that we could find in history that many people believe that Paul was talking about something contemporary that the people of Thessalonica themselves would be able to look for because there were individuals who were saying that the time had already passed. And he was like, no, it ain't came yet. No, right now that it is. And he now who let us will let until he be taken out of the way. 
What does he mean, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way? Who was doing what in Paul's day that he could say, whoever is doing this right now will continue to do that until he is taken out of the way? In reference to, a.k.a., this man of sin. I think that because we are in our day, we can be called futurists or post or a premillennialist, whatever, where we've taken everything out of the Bible and nothing that they wrote applied to their time, whether it was while Paul was living or even if he was dead. He said, look, I know when I am gone, I'm afraid that many going to come and they're going to come in deceiving y'all and tricking y'all. If you research the man of sin and you find out what they were saying, you will never find the Pope coming up until the days of Francisco Bernardo and Martin Luther, a.k.a. the father who, who began what people call the Reformation. The whole idea of the Pope himself being the Antichrist is not old. It's fairly new in this 2,000 years. It's something that's only been talked about for about the last four or 500 years. But research and find out what were they looking for in the second, third, fourth century, and we would have to say they don't know what they were talking about. But I'll tell you what they weren't talking about. They weren't talking about no pope. So when it comes down to it, I think that um, the scripture is an adventure. It is a journey. And I'm hoping that people would see that we came in the spirit tonight to say, hey, y'all, this is already out here. So if people are looking for that, cool. But just like Jezebel, I believe in Revelation chapter 2, I think it is, if you do the research on that, uh, and to the church in Thyatira, I know that woman Jezebel among you who call herself a prophetess, who lead my people astray. If you do research, you'll find out nobody can, not many people think it was a literal woman named Jezebel here. And they do believe that, some believe if it was a woman there, that the Phoenician name Jezebel wasn't even a common name in the first century. But the writer, the Holy Spirit, had the revelator write that because whoever, if it was a woman there, she was coming in the spirit of the Jezebel in the scriptures of old who was deceiving the nation of Israel, or Jezebel was referring to a spirit, a false prophecy that had fell in the church, and that spirit of false prophecy was given a name. So once again, Belial, Jezebel, man of sin, all of these things may not necessarily be personages, just like Israel was looking for Elijah, the prophet, to come according to the book of Malachi. Jesus said that basically Elijah was not a literal person, but Elijah, who y'all was waiting for, you know what? He came. Who was he? He wasn't John the Baptist, but the teaching, the spirit that John the Baptist preached in was Elijah. And how do we know that? Because once, um, I'll end it here, once Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, once his mouth opened up after his son was born and he told him what his name would be, he prophesied on his son and said that he would go forth in the power and spirit of Elijah. So many people would say, well, I'll read Malachi and literally say Elijah, but John the Baptist's father himself prophesied that his son was going to go forth in the power and spirit of Elijah. So were you supposed to be looking for Elijah or his spirit? Well, if you read Malachi, you're looking for a man to be reincarnated or risen from the dead. But it was the spirit of the man according to Jesus and according to John the Baptist's father. So is the man of sin a literal individual we're looking for? That's possible. We hear it. But what if there's something else? That's all we're saying, y'all. What if there's something else? I'm your brother Zadok in Israel. Shabbat Shalom.